Here we go. So um, thank you once again and uh, welcome everyone. So this is just a, a webinar that we're going to host on the project Eries that uh, some of you may or may not know about. Um, the main purpose of today is to, um, let's say, be informative and, and uh, try to explain some of the, the what the project is about, how people can get involved and what the various different um, rules, regulations and stuff like that is. And, and also to present, let's say, the project uh, the project team of what everybody has and, and, and um, can offer as part of the project. Um, I should have mentioned my name is Ger Gerard O'Reilly. I'm a um, assistant professor here in uh, Pavia. Um, I'll be mainly dealing with most of the coordination activities, as some of the people on this call already know. I've been uh, annoying them with emails and everything, but uh, um, I'll be dealing with, let's say, a lot of the day-to-day -day tasks here. So I'm going to get started with um, the first presentation, which is mainly just an overview. Um, I'll, I'll give a, oops, I had an agenda of the of the meeting here somewhere that uh, magically disappeared. Here we go. Can you see the agenda or are you looking at a PowerPoint? It's a little bit too small, but ah, okay. <laughs> Okay, it's better now. Thank you. But the the, the main purpose is just to show okay. that um, is just to show what we're going to try and talk about today. So um, the first is just an overview of the project, what it is and what uh, what um, the, the different parts are of the project, and then maybe talk a bit more about what transnational access is, how that works, and then how people can get involved. Lastly, then there will be um, presentations from all of the different partners, so you can see a, a nice big list of, um, of different laboratories and, and, and uh, many different names. So the idea here is just to give a um, is just to give an idea to all of the people who are maybe interested in the project what the different facilities uh, participating in this project have to offer and what the capabilities are, and maybe who the reference people are, for example. So uh, just to give uh, an idea of what um, what is possible in that respect. So if I flip back over to the presentation, so we'll, we'll get started on, on this side of things. So you can see a full slide, I hope. I'm using two screens, so it's uh, maybe a bit confusing, but um, in any case, um, so the project, what is the project? Um, it, it's it's quite a, a large project and quite a, a strange project in the sense that of how it's structured and how it, uh, it operates. But the main objective of this is to provide transnational access to research infrastructures and the objective then is to uh, conduct research that will advance frontier knowledge related to uh, seismic wind and geotechnical hazards. So there's a little bit to unpack there, and we'll, we'll get through that in the next few slides. Um, the main funding for this comes from the European Commission's Horizon Europe program, so um, just starting this year or possibly late last year, this program. And um, the total budget of the project is, uh, is just, uh, just short of 12 million euros, so we have, um, let's say, a little bit of money to spend on the research activities. Um, the duration will be four years, and we have just kicked off the meeting at the, uh, the, the project at the beginning of June. So we had our kickoff meeting last month, and uh, one of the outcomes of that was it would be a good idea to have a webinar like this, in which we could, uh, we could um, open up and, and um, let's say, disseminate some of what, we, uh, what we're planning on doing to the, to the public and, uh, and possibly answer some questions as well. Um, we have created a project website with a, a lot of information. The details are on the right hand side and also the, the dedicated email address is, is listed there as well. Um, a lot of the stuff I'm showing here is, is listed in more detail on the project website, but um, the idea here is just to give a, a, an idea of structure and then where to find things, let's say, or, or just uh, the, the general concept. So one of the main things of the project is we have three different research goals. And, and what I mean by this is us as a project, us with, uh, let's say, financial backing, we have these goals that we want to achieve. And, and they're very vague, uh, and but let's say slightly specific. Um, and the idea with this is that they're, they're vague so that they can be applicable and, and, uh, and applied in different contexts and different meanings, but with the same overall goal, obviously. So... Um, the, the, the first of, of these is the loss driven design and mitigation approaches, as you can see on the top right hand side. Uh, the second one would be the risk quantification and prioritization. And the third is the green and sustainable development. So the, um, these will be the main goals of the project, which then can be further down, broken down into hazards and research areas, which we'll be uh, looking at in a, in a moment. So to kind of this is the diagram I kind of put together myself um, very recently, just to, to give a bit of structure um, to, to show the how the different parts of what I was showing on the previous slide interact. 
So if we think about those three research goals that I just mentioned, we think about them like vertical work packages or vertical vertical um, pillars of the project. Like they're, they're the main things that the project is gonna base itself on. But when we move down to what we're calling the research areas, and we start to get something looking like this. We have, let's say a more horizontal kind of uh, approach to this. And the idea here is that we have different research areas, different areas in which we can, we can uh, conduct some, some research and experimental testing. Uh, and these would be related to the built environments of research area one, critical infrastructures, industrial in facilities, and also advanced technologies. So these are, let's say, different areas of engineering that can um, that can be looked at in different uh, in different respects, but also can be addressing the three different research goals we looked at before. So, for example, you could be combining in some of the work you're doing, um, research area three, for example, industrial facilities with our research goal two, for example, and looking at uh, the risk quantification and prioritization as part of your work. Let's say that the main flavor or the theme of your, the work that you're doing. Coupling that then with the three different hazards we're looking at, you can kind of see that the three dimensional nature of the project. We're looking at three different hazards of seismic wind and geotechnical. So um, again, with each one of these research goals and research areas, you can have one or more, usually one of the, of the hazards we've mentioned before. So, the, um, the user projects of the, or the actual work that will be carried out should be trying to fit this kind of framework, okay? Um, and, and this is mainly just to give a kind of structure and, uh, and uh, an overall goal or overall uh, thrust of the project to show that uh, what it is we're carrying out and, and using this funding for has, a, has an overall um, ambition. So as I was mentioning before, um, an example TA user projects or TA stands for transnational access, which we will talk about a little bit later, but essentially just means access to a research laboratory or infrastructure. So one of these projects may wish to study the effects of earthquakes. So this would be the seismic hazard. Looking at a residential buildings, so this would fall into the research area of um, the built environment. And it may be looking at uh, now retrofitting techniques that will look at um, loss based design and mitigation approaches. So this will be the research goal and this will follow into the uh, this category here that I was showing before. So this is how you can kind of construct your project to fit the overall the overall um, 3D structure of, of um, the ERIES project. Um, like I mentioned before, the project website has a lot more detail on this. Uh, obviously, I'm showing very uh, simple schematic diagrams here just to give an idea of the the general structure, but the actual project website then will have a lot more information that can um, maybe help you understand what it is we, we mean by certain things and uh, what the general objective of that would be. So I'm showing here the, the project website, the main page or, or one of the, the main menus on the left hand side. And in that drop down menu on research, you can see there's a, a tab called research goals. In there you will find a lot more information about what it is we mean by seismic hazard, geotechnical issues and, and wind and so on. And the same thing as well with research areas. Um, I, I was speaking before, almost assuming everybody knows what I'm, what I'm talking about, but uh, the, the idea here was, is just to, uh, to give a bit more uh, um, specific guidance on this. The actual consortium itself, so the, the, the people who are involved in this project and many of them are here uh, with us today and will be giving a presentation uh, shortly on their relative uh, in infrastructures and, and installations or, or, or lab uh, equipment, let's say, um, are the ones shown on the left-hand side or are also shown on the right-hand side. So you can see um, a general map of where everybody is distributed around Europe. And we have a, a, uh, a nice facility um, joining us from Canada also. Um, many of these have involved in, been involved in past projects, uh, similar kinds of access projects like this before. So the notable examples would be uh, Sarah or um, Ceres, for example. But um, let's say the newer addition of, of in, in this project we have is the addition of many of these wind facilities. So you can see some of them, for example, the University of Genoa, uh, the partners in Canada that I mentioned at Western University, also uh, Eindhoven University, um, I don't want to forget anybody now, are also the, 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 uh, our colleagues in, uh, in Nantes and CSTB. I think I've, I've covered everybody. Um, but the idea here is we have a, a nice distribution of people in different countries all around Europe, uh, looking at different things. Sometimes there may be some overlap between laboratories, but this is uh, not necessarily a bad thing. On the contrary, it's more of a, a complementary thing. It means we have a nice, uh, a nice set of access with, um, with uh, complementary facilities. 
um, a bit more in detail what I showed on the previous um, on the previous slide, and maybe to get a bit more into technical terminology as well, just so that we are uh, we're all on the same page, or it, it's clear what the the terminology on the um, on the website actually refers to. So the transnational access, the TA that we're going to be referring to a lot here, um, what we're offering here, it, we're offering access to some of the, the a big collection of high class experimental installations around Europe and, and, and Canada. So what do we mean by that? What, what's an installation or what's a research infrastructure? So if we're gonna follow the European Commission's um, terminology or, or uh, naming system on this, um, essentially a research infrastructure would be one of the partners we have here. So um, for example, I'm sitting in the EU center building right now, this would be an infrastructure. If you look at the table on the left, on the right hand side here, so this would be the re research infrastructure that, um, that we are participating uh, as part um, of this project with. But within this research infrastructure, we may have different laboratories. So we have uh, different testing equipment. So right now in this project, we're currently offering two different uh, testing equipment. So two different installations is what they're called. So if you see this, this terminology throughout the project or these slides, this is essentially what we're referring to. So the research infrastructures would be like an institute and the installation would be a particular piece of equipment that is being that is being made available as part of the project. So you can see some partners have, have um, one installation, others have two or even three. So um, we have a nice different um, complementary uh, collection of, of, of um, equipment in that respect. So the overall project structure, so this is something I didn't really mention before about how it's all grouped together and maybe where user groups would um, feature in all of this. So, if we, if we look at the left hand side, we see that there's a direct relationship between us, the project coordinators here at uh, IUS, IUSS or, or USE, uh, more commonly called here in Italy, uh, between us and the European Commission, right? So this is um, our, our role as the project coordinator. And then we have our relationship with all of the rest of the, the, um, the different partners all, all on the, the, the left hand side there. So you see the EU Center, CEA, University of Bristol, for example. So this is mainly the project team. This is the, the people that were listed on, on, on the previous slides on the different uh, research infrastructures and, and installations. But the idea with this then is that outside groups, so TA user groups, transnational access user groups, will be able to access and use some of these um, facilities, these uh, installations, as part of the project. Uh, this is mainly the scope here. And access, access them to do what? Well, access them to cover some research projects that would fit that general framework I presented. Uh, I presented a couple of slides ago with the research goals and research areas. So essentially what is uh, what we're doing here is um, the project is, is almost opening its doors with, uh, with uh, funding from the European Commission to carry out work with this uh, general research goal uh, in mind but, uh, but using this with a combination of the, the, the team we've put together in this, in this consortium and also different uh, European, um, different user groups from around Europe and possibly around the world as well. Um, the main way that this will work then, and we'll, of course we'll get into this in a bit more detail then, is um, these external user groups would be submitting their proposals to what we've called the selection and evaluation panel. So this is like a independent body um, some of the members, I know uh, Professor Pequet is here online with this. Um, essentially, the, the proposals that will be put together will be evaluated by this panel and decided who, um, which of, the, of, these, uh, of these proposals will have, uh, will have some access to the uh, infrastructures or the, the installations shown on the left hand side uh, using the funding that uh, has been made available through this project. So the main, so yeah, essentially this is what I have just said uh, in, in a few words um, previously. So they will be assessing the, the, the selection and evaluation panel will assess the feasibility of the user group proposals from a technical viewpoint, but also consider the relevance uh, of the research owns uh, scientific interest. And also the, the relevance of these, um, of these proposals with respect to uh, the overall goals of the, of the project. So as we mentioned before, it will have some members, uh, external members, and these have already been appointed by the General Assembly meeting uh, that we had here in, in June. And these will be uh, the, the faces you see on the screen in front of you. So um, it will be coordinated by myself as, as project coordinator. So we will have uh, joining us from the Northeastern University, Professor Luca Caracolia. So his uh, main, main topics would uh, involve wind engineering, for example. I'm not going to try and um, Let's say describe uh, each each of the CVs we have here, but let's say that the main hazard would be would be wind engineering. 
Um, also, we have Professor Amal El Awadi from uh, Florida International International University. So um, again, looking at uh, looking at wind hazards here. Uh, Professor Michael Fardis, uh, Professor Emer Emeritus at the University of Patras, so working on seismic design. Again, with uh, Professor Alessandra Marini, uh, Professor at the University of Bergamo here in Italy. Again, looking at uh, seismic hazard and uh, Professor Fekir. Who's, uh, who's joining us on the screen um, from, from France, looking at, uh, let's say, geotechnical issues. Again, I don't want to be uh, too um, coarse in my summary of, of some of the expertise of the people you see on the screen here, but of course, um, we feel, and uh, I think that the, the opinion was shared at the general, at the general assembly meeting that um, the people you see on the screen here would be, would be more than sufficient or more than uh, let's say appropriate to be evaluating the kind of proposals we, we hope to receive for this project. Um, and, and receive at our, our different laboratories around Europe. So the calls for proposals that will go out, so how does this work? So essentially what we have is a project in which we're going to have many more calls for proposals or, or accepting more, more little projects as part of the bigger projects. So little mini projects or user group uh, projects, they, they will be called um, as part of the overall effort of the, of the ERIS project. This will be handled centrally by us at use. And um, the idea is that we want to leave the call for proposals generally open. So um, it's actually open right now. You can go to the website and submit some documentation. But uh, what we're going to try and do is have some general cutoff dates. So um, these will be called the collection and evaluation dates in which we essentially all of the, the forms that have been submitted, all of the applications will be submitted, will be collected and distributed to the, um, to the uh, selection and evaluation panel members. Um, so it's essentially like a deadline. Um, after that, the next one will come a couple of months later uh, and so on and so forth until, uh, until towards the end of the project or um, depending on, on, on the available funds and so on. This is something we need to, we need to um, see as how it goes as, as, uh, as the project proceeds. And it's for this reason we have the first date is fixed at the end of September, but also the other dates there are mainly indicative just to give an idea of when we expect them to be, but these are subject to uh, some change as well. Um, we're hoping, and uh, you'll see this as well during the, um, the user group proposals, that these will be generally short proposals. Uh, and the idea with this is to have a, a relatively quick turnaround time in the evaluation of this. We're hoping to have this done in a matter of weeks and not, not, not months, let's say, so we can have uh, some answers to the user groups in a relatively short period of time just to avoid, um, let's say, that, uh, that empty, empty time in uh, while waiting for an evaluation, because uh, at the end of the day, we have a project that we need to, we need to proceed. Um, so how do we apply? So we've tried to streamline this in, 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 uh, by using the, the Google form system. I think a lot of, a lot of people are using this for different, uh, for different reasons now, like surveys or submitting documentation. So we think it's a, a relatively easy way to, um, to submit documentation, so we're going to be adopting this kind of uh, this kind of uh, approach. Um, the instructions and the documentation, the proposal, the, the templates, everything is all available on the website. If you go to the right section, and the link to the actual form, then is is there. Um, inside each one of these documents, there are four, which we will see in a moment. Um, there are a series of instructions about what you should generally try to describe, some rules on, on page limits, some, um, some uh, specific things that are requested and, and should be declared, and um, mainly applicants who don't respect these general limits in terms of page limit uh, and, and so on. Uh, won't be considered for evaluation. So uh, if the page limit says 12 or possibly 14, we will see it in a moment, and an applicant submits something that is 30 pages, it, it will not be considered for evaluation. So this, is, I think, is, is more than fair. Um, in addition to this, what we're leaving um, user groups, uh, we're giving them the possibility to submit, let's say, a set of slides or sketches. So a free template, nothing, no general rules or, or requests, but the idea is just to have a, a maximum of five slides in which um, people who are proposing their projects can give an idea of some sketches, some diagrams of what they expect to test and what they're hoping to do. So it's it's much more clear than, than let's say, using figures in, in a Word document or, or something like that, so that um, so that uh, it can help the, the evaluation panel to better understand what it is the, the people are proposing. So as I mentioned before, we'll be using the Google form. This unfortunately means that you require a Google account. Um, many institutions have this now as part of their um, emailing system, but if not, uh, it 
personal email would would more than suffice to do this so I, it's not such a big uh, obstacle in that sense um there are mainly three steps that uh, go into this um, application process so there are some some text describing this on the right hand side you can follow through this on the, on the website um, with me as, as i'm speaking right now but uh, these are just screenshots i took from the from the website just to show here the first are general proposal details and then they will have something about the user group leader so the user group leader will be let's say the pi of this mini project it'll, it'll be called a user group leader for for um, just terminology's sake and then we'll have the annexes and these these are mainly the the main uh, the main part of the proposals where you have a lot of the scientific uh, content the, the technical details and, and and so on and so forth so if you look at the proposal details this is mainly general information that we can collect and, and have an idea of the overview of the project um mainly the title which kinds of hazards and uh and um research areas are being addressed so as I was mentioning before, the general structure of the project, those blocks I was showing, we're trying to uh, have users check the boxes of where their project is trying to, it, it, the issues it's trying to tackle so that it, it'll be easier for us to identify where people are focusing their efforts. And also which of the, of the experts on the, on the selection and evaluation panel would be most appropriate to evaluate these kinds of projects because some people would come with different uh, skill sets in that sense. Um, some main things like proposal acronym, the title, which which hazards are you focusing on, the, the research areas, and so on. Um, one thing I didn't mention before, I didn't get so into detail about the research areas, but I'll just make a, a quick note on it now. Um, the research areas we're looking at is the built environment. Uh, the, the first one would be the built environment, so this would be a very standard, um, let's say, everyday life kind of situation. Uh, a research area, so let's say residential housing, uh, office space, uh, commercial space, and a very typical kind of construction, so let's say. Um, the second one, so research area two, would be critical infrastructure. So let's say, think about a, a bigger picture like a road networks or, or, or something along that line. Again, there is more description on the website, but I'm just trying to give a feeling now in, in this call. The third one would be industrial facilities where you may have um, power plants and something like that, or, or, or oil refineries where um, very particular kinds of, uh, of, um, of elements of, of structures and even non-structural elements would be pre present in these kinds of in these kinds of facilities. So that kind of and may have a different kind of scope as well with respect to um, with respect to the built environment. So that, that kind of distinction has been met there. The fourth one is, is referring to advanced technologies. And this is, uh, let's say, a little bit vague in, in, in how it's described, but we, we um, decided to make a distinction here. Advanced technologies can mean two different things in this project. Ideally, we, we talked about it in terms of mitigation devices. So let's say a specialized kind of device that's going to help us out with these hazards or these, uh, these research goals that we have. So a classic example could be some kind of, uh, of damper that could help out a structure in, uh, in strong wind or seismic shaking. This would be like a mitigation device or a kind of base isolation system, so on and so forth. So this would be like a new advanced technology that people may want to test and, um, and evaluate uh, using experimental testing. But also from the other point of view, we, we want to look at, say, frontier knowledge in, in, a, in a different perspective. And this would look at the experimental techniques that we're actually using. So, um, advanced technologies in the same way that we can improve ourselves uh, as laboratories, uh, as people who are conducting testing, by looking at the methods we actually use to test them. So one of the, 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 the work packages in this project, and it's, it's described on the website, is looking at the idea of using hybrid simulation and trying to discover new ways that, that, can, be, that can be brought um, to users in this kind of project by the actual testing method itself. So in, in the idea of, uh, or in the research area for this advanced technologies, we kind of have two different perspectives. Are you looking at the actual product you're using or the method you're using to, to evaluate that kind of project or that kind of, um, that kind of research? Again, this is just a small uh, subtle uh, distinction between, between the two of, uh, of these uh, same research area. Okay, so the user group leader. So, um, so who is that? That is essentially the PI of the project, uh, of the other project, um, of, of the user group project that is being uh, being submitted. Um, it is the, the, the person who is going to lead the effort and was responsible for the submission, the primary contact, and so on and so forth. I think this is a, a very uh, straightforward kind of um, uh, straightforward kind of um, situation. So, uh, again, we're just requesting area. Um, 
information, name, surname, position within a company, email addresses, uh, contact organization, stuff like that. And the, the organization country, which is uh, shown here on the right hand side. And this is a, let's say, a relatively important part of this project. Because if we think about it, um, this is a project giving transnational access. Okay, so it's giving access to people uh, who are not from that country. So this, uh, maybe I will have a better example in a slide or two, but what it means is it's the project is geared towards European researchers. So the, the, your, uh, the user group leader must be coming from, um, if we look at the, the first line here on this slide, the user group leader's country must be within the EU and EU associated country and must not coincide with the country in which the TA facility is located within. So there's a little bit to unpack there. What does that mean? It means that if I'm trying to submit a project to this, uh, this uh, EU's consortium and I want to conduct something in a laboratory, I cannot go to the laboratory next door and just do something with, um, with uh, people I maybe have good relationships with and, um, and uh, experimental um, facilities that I've used before. It's kind of forcing European researchers to go abroad and go to different countries and interact with uh, with different um, with different institutions and let's say disseminate the research around different um, different countries. So it's let's say forcing people to have this transnational access to uh, to different laboratories. So this is what it means when it says the user group leaders. So the person who's leading this project. Their, uh, their institution country must not coincide with the, the country in which the facility is located. So this uh, also has the distinction of the user group leader's country, for example. Um, I'll, I'll use the example of myself. I'm, I'm originally from Ireland, but um, um, I'm working in Italy. So in, in my situation on, on paper, I, I, I show up as an Italian researcher, even though I'm from actually from uh, a different country or my passport says something else. So this essentially means that I cannot go and do some uh, experimental testing in a, in a different laboratory in, in Italy. I must go to someone like um, France, uh, Portugal, or, or so on and so forth. So this is the, uh, the, the spirit here. Um, the exact list and the, the, um, the, the, uh, the countries that uh, fall into these categories are available at the link there because it's not just EU member states. We have these uh, different associated countries and uh, and people who are about to join the Horizon Europe um, program as well. So there's a uh, let's say there's a it's not just EU, but it's also extended beyond that uh, that boundary as well. So these are the different uh, groups you can see on the bottom of the slides. The EU member states, of course, uh, the ones that are that are shown there. The associated countries that are also eligible for this are the ones that are shown there: Armenia, Bosnia and Herzegovina. And, uh, and so on and so forth. And the associated countries that are, are planning to join will be Albania right down to the, the UK. Possibly the most notable um, absentees from this are Switzerland, um, which uh, apparently, according to the documentation we have seen so far, is not planning on joining the program. So this would mean that user group leaders whose um, host institute is a, a research, an organization within Switzerland, are currently not eligible to take part as the research group um, leader. This does not prevent them from taking part as, let's say, uh, a member of a different group, but they, they cannot lead projects, is essentially what that means. And this also applies to people outside of Europe. So there's nothing preventing, let's say, a very strong team from, from France, for example, applying to use a research infrastructure in Italy, but also having some, uh, some experts um, from the United States, for example, or from Australia, from outside of Europe, um, provided uh, certain criteria are met, uh, and also there's a there's a motivation behind why um, why these these members would need to be a part of this this team. Um, possibly the most um, the critical in that sense is that the user group, the, the entire user group, it must be at least uh, sixty percent or two thirds, I think, is the the actual number. It's around that anyway. It must be um, EU based, so there's some scope to allow some, let's say people outside the, the countries you see on the screen right now, but uh, they cannot be, let's say, one European researcher and 10, uh, let's say, Japanese researchers, just, just to give an example. Um, I think for obvious reasons, um, the uh, user group leaders or user groups with uh, members from Russia are currently not permitted to, to take part in the, uh, in the program because of the various sanctions and, uh, and stuff that is going on at the moment. Okay, so in terms of the annexes, um, what exactly are these? Well, 
the, the first one is probably the most important is the actual application format where you're going to describe or where or users would describe the actual project or the the the, the the proposal they're trying to put together. The rest are essentially just going to be the annexes of, of uh, some details about the, the, the group and uh, CVs and so on. So um, each of these have a template. It's available on the website. You can download the zip file and each of the files will be there and some instructions will be made available inside these. And uh, we ask you to, to read those carefully and follow those, um, follow those instructions that are listed there. So the first one is, is this transnational access user project application form. So this is the, the main application form. Let's say the part B document that uh, we're all very familiar with it as part of European projects. Um, it's divided up into four sections. The first one is discussing the research group. Uh, the second is the research infrastructures that it's, uh, it's applying to. Then the, the third one is the actual you know, the user project proposal. So the actual proposal that is being put together. The fourth one would be, let's say, an estimated schedule or, or the, the anticipated schedule that people would be um, estimating to, to, um, to require to, to execute this project. So within this document, there's a series of text within all written in blue. Um, these are all instructions. These should all be deleted prior to the, the completion of this document. Um, and that you can see some of the, an example of this on the right hand side there. So these, these are just instructions for users that should be deleted and uh, fill out the, the text as normal in, in, in black font. So as I mentioned before, the page length is 12 pages, so it's relatively short, um, but uh, we think it, it's, a, it's a relatively fair compromise given the, the, the let's say the speed we're trying to um, get these evaluations done with and, and also uh, have users, let's say, be, be a bit more concise about what it is they're trying to achieve with, uh, with the user project they're submitting to, um, to us uh, as part of the user project. So the user group. So I've mentioned the user group leader before, but what is the user group? Well, it's essentially the user group leader and all of the people working with them. So it's, it's the collection of people from one or more institutes eligible to, to present a TA user project proposal. So I've mentioned some of these criteria before. And, uh, and some of are, are repeated here again, just to just for clarity. Um, so the user group leader is the, mainly the responsible person, is the, the PEI of the project, if you want to use that kind of terminology, terminology. And their institution must be within one of those countries uh, that I've mentioned before. Um, also within this document, within this uh, description document or the, the application form, we ask, um, we ask the proposals to give a short description of the organizations the people comprising these and basically try to explain what it is, why this team is being put together. Uh, if it's people from different organizations, what experience have, do they have in the past? Um, why are they relevant to work with, with each other? And just a small justification of, of why this, um, this team will be richer by this combination of, of users. The second part then is moving on to the research infrastructure. So this is essentially the, the menu of the laboratories that we have on offer as part of this project, and the uh, which would be the preference, uh, essentially the, the main preference or, or which, uh, which research infrastructure you would be applying to. Um, there's some flexibility in this, but in, in some cases, it may be just that um, user user projects or the, these proposals would have, uh, would have one research infrastructure in mind. The idea of having a preference is, is just to give us some flexibility in, in the case that possibly towards the end of the project, for example, it may be that one, um, one laboratory with a shaking table, for example, is, is quite full and, and, and uh, has a lot of their access already, already assigned, whereas another one with maybe similar features or capabilities could have some access as well. So there could be a preference that if one laboratory is available, we would like to go there because for, for a certain set of reasons, but also if, if it's not possible, we would like to go, uh, we would also be open to using a different laboratory with similar capabilities, for example. And this applies to, let's say, wind tunnels as well, which, which we have more, more than one of those um, available in the project. A quick note, uh, it's actually a typo on the slide here. Um, the table I'm showing on the right-hand side has GRC uh, listed there and has the country listed as Italy. So a quick clarification on that. The GRC is a European Commission uh, based or sponsored organization, so it's uh, it's uh, technically country-less. It doesn't actually uh, the, the word Italy associated with that should not be there. The laboratory is physically in Italy, but it, it does not uh, let's say come under the restrictions of uh, transnational access in the same way other laboratories do. So this means that research group 
from from Italy can actually apply to to, to the uh, to the laboratory uh, at JRC. There's there's no limit on the transnational aspect of that. Um, so sorry about that. Um, one thing that is is um, important to note is that while people may be putting together their proposals with a particular laboratory in mind, it's also important to get in touch with these laboratories. There's, there's nothing preventing uh, people, actually it's actively encouraged to, to get in touch with uh, these laboratories who, who people are thinking about applying to, to talk about possible access, what's available, what the capability would be, whether a certain proposal would make sense or not, so that some initial feedback could be given that um, a proposal would be, would be sensible, would be uh, feasible in a certain laboratory, and then if the actual scope of the project makes sense or not with respect to the overall thrust of the ERIS project, that will be evaluated later. But at least on a technical feasibility perspective, um, there, there is no, uh, there, there is no um, shortcomings there, or at least we try to avoid them. Obviously, we, we want to avoid the situation where somebody presents a, a, an exceptional project, but um, for various reasons, it's just not feasible in, in some of the infrastructures that are available. Um, this would be, uh, let's say, a slip up or something that could be easily avoided by just some, some communication prior to the, the submission. So the people that are um, indicated, um, or let's say associated with each one of these uh, research infrastructures I'm showing on the right hand side, they're listed on the project website. So if you go to the project website, look up, go to the section with the research infrastructures, find the, the corresponding laboratory. Each one of these will have a contact person and their email address there. So feel free to, to get into contact with each one of these and, uh, and um, have an idea of what, uh, of what maybe needs to be looked at prior to, to submitting a proposal. So this is essentially what, uh, what I was mentioning before. So based on the proposed research, they must specify, uh, a user group must specify the type of research infrastructure they wish to, they, they wish to use and, and best use their project. Um, these are kind of the justifications that we ask people to give in, in the application form. So not just to say that we want to use this shaking table or this wind tunnel, but also to give some motivation of why that, why that certain installation makes sense for them. And, um, and so on. So it's just more of a motivation for, for a particular piece of, of testing equipment. So then we get to the actual user project proposal. This is a section three, if I'm not mistaken, within the application form. Here we follow more of a, a classical um, proposal kind of structure. We have the summary, state of the art, description of the proposal, and so on. So we can see how we are um, breaking this down into people to summarize what it is they want to do, uh, refer to some of the state of the art, and look at the description that the, um, and actually describe their proposal. So looking at the objectives, the, the actual test specimen that they, they want to look at and the uh, a potential schedule of, of our program of, of what it is they, or when they expect something like this to, to be carried out. And this is something that can be uh, understood better with uh, some interaction with the, uh, the actual research infrastructure. Then towards the end of the application form, we get more towards the, um, let's say, how, how this, how the actual proposal links to the project that, I, that I've been mentioning at the, at the beginning of this presentation. So I mentioned the different um, research goals, research areas, and so on. So this is the point where uh, user groups would be required to, let's say, um, link their proposal let's say, show how it uh, fits into the overall goal or the overall objective of the ERIS project. So there's no point in presenting a very, a very nice proposal that could fit the infrastructures very well and could be very capable, but isn't really addressing what it is we're trying to do here. Um, so this is uh, an important thing to, to keep in mind. And not only with this project, but also the innovation and impact on a general scale. How, how would this uh, impact the, the, the research community or the industry on a, on a general level? And uh, if, there could be any synergy with ongoing research and, and, and things like this. So we're looking a little bit beyond the, the not, not just the project objectives, but also a little bit uh, beyond the horizons we have, we have um, talked about before. And of course, the dissemination and exploitation of results as well. Um, just in case I don't have a slide mentioning it um, in the next few moments, 
But one of the requirements of the of the project is that anybody who's getting transnational access as part of this project is required to publish the data and make it available afterwards. So essentially, this means that um, experimental data that is carried out and uh, and developed, let's say, is, is required to be made available and findable, accessible, and so on with these different criteria. Um, this is um, possibly a, a, a particular point for industry partners um, who, who, for example, may wish to test some proprietary um, piece of equipment, uh, some kind of device or something, and would rather not publish the data. Um, in this kind of situation, it's not possible to, to partake in the project because it's one of the requirements that this data must be public afterwards. So if, if uh, your objective is to not publish the data, then uh, this isn't uh, this isn't the place um, possibly you should be looking, but again, this is just a small um, parenthesis or, or uh, requirement of the project in, in in the interest of of being open and transparent. So the schedule. So the, there's a lot of text here, but um, the, the the main idea is just to applicants should be giving some estimate of the starting date month when they would like to. Uh, Hopefully, like to to commence with their with their uh, with their project. Obviously, this depends on the on the laboratory or the research infrastructure that they're applying to. When the schedule can be can be accommodated and, and can be worked out, the estimated amount of days or access they would require, and also um, the, the duration of of, of this. So. Um, there, there's some specifications here about what it is an access date generally refers to. So this would be installation or the setting up of, of an actual specimen uh, and the actual testing and so on, the instrumentation, things like this. These are specified in more detail in the, the user agreements, for example, but this is just to give a general flavor here. Um, the days spent for the activities that don't involve this, so if people are up on site and not actually using the laboratory, these would not uh, not be generally not considered as access units or access days as part of the project. So um, it's just to make a distinction there about what it is we, we mean in terms of access. So as I mentioned before, the schedule. So just to give an idea of, of the different uh, stages, like the design of the test uh, specimen and the setting up, the actual construction of the models and so on. So just to give an idea of, of when it is and, and what it is you plan on doing to, throughout the um, throughout the project proposal, should it be successful, to give an idea then to the laboratories of, of how that can be accommodated and, and worked into the schedules. So the, the annexes then, as I mentioned before, are essentially just a collection of, um, let's say, details uh, from the different users, user groups, organizations. This is more not just statistics, but it's it's uh, necessary information that we require as, as part of the as part of the project. But it's it's nice to have this this information as well. Um, the Microsoft Excel sheets. So it's it's essentially just filling out the the names of the organization, addresses, websites, countries, and so on. And some of these have dropped down menus. So uh, in the case of the user group leader, for example, the the, the limited countries that I mentioned before, uh, the actual op options available are limited to those. So um, it kind of takes care of itself in in, in that respect. And also in the same the same way with the user group. So if we have more um, users like um, not just the, the the user group leader, but also people who will be collaborating, we also um, ask some information on that as well. So the last are the, the Annex B and C. So these are essentially the CVs of the people. Um, this Annex B is the CV of the user group leader. It's a, it's a little bit uh, longer. It's uh, three pages uh, at most, so just uh, some some uh, summary information about their CV and their, their gen general curriculum. And the, the other members, the user group members, then will be limited to, to two pages, essentially. Um, we've tried, we've provided again a, a template to follow here. Uh, and the general structure is the, the one that has been used for ERC applications, for example. So maybe some people have this kind of format or the, the Europass general format that has been used uh, in, in many different kinds of projects as well. We try to accommodate just to avoid people copying and pasting the same information in, into slightly different structures. So we're hoping to um, facilitate or, or make that a bit more streamlined. Um, then the actual evaluation criteria, this is a, and I've put this in very nice red text on the bottom right of the slide here, just to say that this is tentative. This is a, a, a first draft and it's something that it needs to be discussed and finalized with the actual selection and evaluation panel, which will have its first meeting in a, in a couple of days. Um, so some of these numbers and some of these criteria may slightly change. 
but in any case this will be the actual final scoring will be made available on the website on the on the actual page um, the relevant page well before the deadline so people know exactly what the criteria are there will not be quick changes in in, in in scoring or anything this is just because we haven't had the chance to have a meeting with the panel yet but i wanted to give the the general idea of what the scoring could potentially be so that people have an idea of, of how this would would possibly work so um you see here it's how it's based on a set of, of criteria like the relevance to the the research areas the research goals like i mentioned before how this uh how this could be justified with respect to the arts is there any synergies with existing uh, other uh, transnational access activities and also um a, a feasibility aspect with the with respect to the the research infrastructure that is being uh, being applied to this is currently put as a yes no decision and what this was initially intended to be was that if someone was applying to have access to a laboratory, um, the panel would also be looking, will be seeking the opinion of that laboratory or that research infrastructure to say, what is your opinion on this, on this actual um, proposal? Is it something that is feasible? Is it something that is in your interest? Um, yes or no. Um, maybe yes or no is a bit too cut and dry. So maybe we 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 could possibly. Um, revise that to let's say a scoring system where the actual lab will give a score based on their based on their uh, perspective of the proposal so that's something we need to just uh quickly check and uh, and clarify but it's it's more than likely going to be a, a scoring system to, just to just to make that obvious now um and again this is just so that it's not just an external panel who maybe are not so intimately uh, familiar with the laboratory who are making the decisions for the laboratory, but is that there's going to be some input of the laboratory who could say that, look, that proposal doesn't make any sense. It, it, uh, it, it doesn't say it's not feasible for a laboratory or it's not something we, we, um, we can possibly do. So there's some, uh, some interaction in that, uh, in that uh, respect. But then the, the actual final criteria, and again, this is also a, 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 um, a draft um, structure or draft, um, how to put it, um, set of, of recommendations. But the, the overall idea of what we're trying to follow here is, is let's say the, the peer review process that most of us are familiar with in, in um, submitting of the submission of papers. So the, the, the kind of idea of accept major revisions, minor revisions and reject that this kind of thing so that it's not such a, a cut and dry yes or no evaluation so that if um if someone has a, a, a quite a good proposal that maybe needs some minor modifications it's it's essentially a minor revisions uh minor revisions um exception um but it may be that the the general idea is good but something really needs to be evaluated uh, revised or some major revisions need to be made and this would be the second kind of criteria here that um that uh, could be could be considered. So maybe some major revisions and uh, real evaluation could be made at the same proposal. But then it may be that the 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 um, the proposal may need to be revised to such an extent that um, a quick uh, a short revision may not be possible, and uh, it may be let's say encouraged to to resubmit at a later date. And then of course the the, the last one as as being an unsuitable proposal is the is just a, a rejection essentially for for various reasons. Again, these are tentative, so the, the idea of how to combine these recommendations in the point scoring system will be a bit more clear once we have, um, once we have had time to, to discuss this. So the actual idea of, of um, how this process will work and how the, the panel will decide these things will be, will be a bit more clear or clearer in, uh, in a few weeks. Um, but again, this will be made available on the website. And, and the idea here with these two slides is just to give a flavor of what it is we have in, in mind or the, the general idea of, of what we, we um, are, are thinking about uh, doing in, inside the project. So um, I think the next thing just to mention briefly is that uh, if we look at the structure here again, we have this uh, essentially the consortium on the left hand side with the, the coordinators and the general group of people or, or research infrastructures that have been um, um, joined together as part of the EURES project. But then on the right hand side, we have these user groups, which um, will be applying to the, the panel and hopefully interacting with the, with the different members of the consortium, depending on the access granted. But one of the important things here is the actual TA uh, user agreement. So this would be the user agreement that uh, that uh, relates the how the let's say the external user group uh, what they can expect and almost like the contract that is being is being signed with the with the um, 
research infrastructure there they've been given access to so this is just something that is uh, that is mentioned here it, um, again this is something that we'll, we'll be seeing much further down the line but uh, again it's just something to be aware of that these kinds of uh, let's say documentation or, or technical agreements that uh, do do exist and I think that is it. So um, we can maybe stop here if there are any questions or people would like to ask anything to, to be clarified before we move on to the next presentations. So um, I would ask people, I'm not sure how many people are, are currently here, but uh, if people could raise their hand or, or use some kind of system like that within Zoom, it may be easier. No, I guess everybody is is uh, is um, very happy, or everything was very clear. So this is um should be still seeing the 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 screen I was showing before. So this is essentially the first part of the the webinar, where I'm just giving an overview of the project and the actual transnational access. One thing actually I didn't mention, and this is a very a key part of the of the um, yes, Antonio, go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, th thanks, Jared. Uh, j just one question that that uh, I think will maybe be important to to clarify, and maybe you can you can answer, uh, which is related to the to the travel and accommodation uh, of the of the users. This was I was I was just thinking of this. I never clarified okay. what transnational access actually means. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so transnational. Thank you for for reminding me of that. So when I when we talk about transnational access here, I, I mentioned the restrictions with respect to geography or country. Let's say that uh, people from one country must go to the ex, the next one and so on. But what do we mean by the actual access in this? So the access actually means that people who are submitting their user proposals or the user group proposals here. Um, they're essentially applying for free access to the laboratories. So this would mean the cost of, of using the laboratory, paying for the staff and so on, and uh, instrumentation would be, would be covered, in addition to the cost of the actual specimen. So let's say, for example, I'm looking to test a, um, a reinforced concrete wall in one of the laboratories that are, are made available in this, in this project. Um, the actual access for me to go and, and use that laboratory is covered by the project. Uh, depending on, on the number of access days I've been granted. Um, the uh, interaction with the staff, their time, everything is covered as well. Also, the cost of construction and demolition of the, of the test specimen is covered, in addition to the travel and, and, um, and, sub and accommodation costs as well, because, of course, one of the uh, key parts of the transnational access is the moving between different countries. So the, the actual expenses to, to move a research group from one country to another um, for, for a limited number of days within the within the, while they have access to a research infrastructure, this is also um, accounted for as part of the budget as well. Um, the, the travel budget is not infinite, uh, unfortunately, but uh, it is something that uh, we, we think is reasonable and it's something that is made available and, and can be managed, let's say, um, in, uh, in collaboration with the actual research infrastructure that will be, that will be um, visited. So, for example, if we use Antonio as an example, um, who just asked the question, if we're going to, to Lisbon, for example, to use uh, LNEC, um, there will be some budget available and some amount of access that, uh, that, that could be used there. And by interacting with Antonio, uh, he, could, uh, he could give a better idea of what, uh, what that would be and how that would work. But uh, the general structure is that. So the general idea of the transnational access is essentially free access to do experimental testing in these, in these laboratories and to go and collaborate with the, with the actual research uh, groups who are who are there in these different research infrastructure or these uh, these different groups, and that, that's also a key point that should be should be underlined as well is that um, just to avoid the the, the feeling that um, it's a, a, a service is being offered, it's it's not maybe user groups should not see it in that way that it's uh, they're they're applying to have um, experimental testing and they're getting access and then everything should be fine, uh, do their testing and go home and. Uh, not talk to the research infrastructure again. Um, it's not really the, the, the general spirit. It's, it's, it's been mentioned in more than one of the, the documents as part of the call and the grant agreement, for example, with the European Commission, is that this, the scope is to have people interact. It's, it's to have people come to a research uh, laboratory who maybe they're coming from an institute which does not have some laboratories and they can go to one that has uh, some nice capabilities and interact and collaborate with them. So it's, it should be very much seen as a joint effort with the, with the people who are hosting you. So um, 
as part of the actual development of the research, it should be something that is done in, in, in quite close collaboration. Because at the end of the day, um, they possibly have a lot more experience in using that kind of equipment or knowing how to use that kind of stuff uh, with respect to someone maybe who is, who is not less familiar with these, these kinds of laboratories. But um, I think this is maybe the, uh, the few things that should be clarified with, uh, with transnational access. Un unless there's anything else you would like to add, Antonio. You have, you've been involved in this uh, longer than I have, so maybe, maybe. Okay, thanks for the thumbs up. So while I'm looking at the, the PDF we're seeing here on the, on, the, uh, on the screen in front of us, you can see that the main idea here of this webinar was just to give an idea of, of the project, the overview of what it is, what the main, let's say, thrust of the project should be, and also how, what this transnational access stuff is that uh, I talked about it for a long time, but I never actually explained the, the, the fundamental definition of, of what transnational access is, but there it is right at the end. So um, the idea now is to move to um, an overview of the different uh, facilities or the installations if we're using, the, sorry, the research infrastructures, if we're using the correct terminology that are being uh, being offered as part of this uh, part of this project. So what I've asked everybody to do, so all of the different partners, is just to put together a short presentation on some of the, the past activities, the capabilities, and, and let's say the potential opportunities that could be available at their different research infrastructures. So, um, the first one is uh, the, the facilities that are made available here in, uh, in Pavia. So unfortunately, I, I'm presenting again, but it's, it's just a couple of slides to give an idea of what this is. So this would be the first, um, the first TA1, so transnational access to this thing called the, the 9D lab, the 9D uh, shaping table, and the mobile lab here at the, at the EU Center Foundation. So let me just quickly try and find this. Oh, and just while, while I see it, this is the, the project website I was mentioning before, where you can see much of the information that I was talking about before, how to apply and everything is available on the website, just to, just to give you an idea of what's, uh, what's being made available here. So, um, it's not so quick, but but yes, so so this kind of information is here, the links and so on. So uh, hopefully everything should be clear from the from the website. So as part of the let's say um, Pavia uh, transnational access offer. So what we're what we're talking about here is this thing called the ninety shaking lab, ninety lab or ninety shaking uh, ninety lab shaking table, and the mobile lab. So if you look at the, the first one here, the 9D lab, so why do, you, why do we call it 9D? Well, it's, it's not nine dimensions, it's nine degrees of freedom. So essentially what this is, is a, a classic shaking table. Uh, as you can see on the left-hand side is a shaking table, the lower grid platform. This would be not a traditional shaking table, but it has six degrees of freedom in the sense that it can move about its uh, three translational, translational and uh, three rotational degrees of freedom, but also, We've added three further uh, degrees of freedom uh, with this uh, this uh, upper grid platform here. So essentially, there are two shaking tables uh, located one on top of the other, and um, the bottom one would have six degrees of freedom, and the top one would have uh, an additional three. So this is where we get the nine D from. Um, the peculiar, okay, some some of the technical uh, details are shown on the right hand side there, just for for your information, but. Um, the general idea here is that it offers, let's say, different capabilities to to um, to test different uh, different kinds of setups, different kinds of peculiar situations that may not be possible with a, a more traditional shaking table. Obviously, this um, there are some compromises in terms of power or maybe size with this kind of thing with respect to other kinds of tables. But the um, the um, let's say the benefits or the the, the niche uh, capabilities we think are are, are um, more than more than worth it. So here we have some, just some demonstrative videos. Hopefully you can hear the audio as well, just to show how this uh, works. There's also the uh, inauguration video will be shown on the next slide as well. So we can do this. The same again, it's possibly the same test. So again, we can see we have the the uh, six degrees of freedom on the lower level and the, the upper level is doing something else. So this could be something that could simulate two slabs of a building, for example, to, to look at the uh, dam potential damage to a piping system or, uh, or other kinds of non-structural elements. And this was one of the main, the main focuses during the design and, and the development of this laboratory was, was how this can look at uh, the, the testing of, of non-structural elements. 
So, so again, this is just some some of the dimensions, just to just to um, make a note of this um, in terms of the upper and the lower grids and the interstory height that we have available. And this should be, if I'm not mistaken, a the inauguration of this actual table. So during the kickoff meeting of the Eries project, we had you see now. We had the actual inauguration of this 9D lab. So we set up a, a relatively simple experiment and had some That was essentially the, the testing that was carried out just to inaugurate the, the 9D lab. So this, this relatively new piece of equipment that we have here in Pavia. And uh, again, more information of the technical details and, and those videos and everything will be will be available online on, on YouTube, as, as you could see. Um, the second one is the, the mobile lab, which is an even more peculiar piece of equipment again, in terms of it, it, its, its novelty or, or its capability as well. And essentially what this is, is, is a mobile testing lab. So uh, what we have here is, is something that could almost be considered like a mobile test uh, shaking table or, or a mobile lab that we can bring around and maybe bring to different uh, different scenarios where it may not be possible to bring uh, a certain specimen or a certain thing into, an, uh, into a lab. So we bring the lab to the, to the specimen almost. Um, so these are some of the components here, the hydraulic power, electric power, the actuator system and, and so on. And uh, again, some of the capabilities are shown here, uh, in addition to the, the general equipment and how it's set up with, within the, the mobile truck that is, uh, that is being, uh, being used to drive this thing around. Um, one, of the, um, the, one of the potential uses for this was, was, envisaged, it was envisaged to be used as a in-situ shaking table. So one of the examples that was designed here on this slide, you can see is that an existing house, for example, could be let's say, um, lifted up from its foundation in the same way you would do this with a, with a base isolation intervention, but instead of placing a base isolation system, just placing a very simple roller system. And um, with the right amount of, of reaction wall and, and, uh, and so on, this kind of equipment could be used almost to uh, essentially conduct an in-situ shaking table test of a, a, an existing building. So this is just one of the, the many different um, potential uses for this um one of the other ones then is uh, given the general characteristics of it it could be used also to do some uh testing on bridges viaducts and dams using the different configurations you can see here so uh possibly interacting or using this to to test an actual bridge structure or possibly even use it in um uh, in uh geotechnical context context as well depending on the on the apparatus or the the setup of the actual testing so um there's a lot of uh, possibility there. Uh, let's say new ground to be discovered. So um, that's something we're, we're quite excited about as well, about how we can use this in different contexts and, and also tackle the, the issues that we're, we're mentioning here as part of this project. And um, that is all from me on the EO Center. So, and all from me in general. So um, what we'll do now is we'll generally move between each one of the partners. So some of them cannot be here. So we have a video to play back. But for the ones who are who are here, and we'll go through them in in, uh, in order as we have done before in a previous meeting, um, I will just ask them to share the screen and and, and present their laboratories like uh, like we had talked about before. So the first one we have up is the University of Patras. So it would be Status Buzias from University of Patras. If you can share your screen and talk to us about what you have available in uh, in Patras. Sure. Second. Uh, so, uh, hello, I'm Stavis Busias from the University of Patas, uh, director of the Straxas Laboratory. The laboratory was established in 1991, but it moved into new premises in the 2000. And the new premises comprise a strong floor. It's a strong floor reaction wall laboratory. The strong floor is about 16 by 18 meters. And the two reaction walls are uh, placed in a biaxial configuration to allow um, several setups to be realized. The, um, the equipment employed uh, includes uh, about uh, eight, eight actuators of one meganewton, one, mega, one meter capacity. One can find the specific details in, um, in our website. 
and the system can be configured in different in different ways so that um, cyclic testing of components and structures can be realized and also hybrid also dynamic testing uh, of earthquake excited structures can be can be um, also uh, realized and actually the the lab complement the um, uh, prototype size capabilities for cyclic for cyclic or hybrid simulation testing at the Jones Research Center. Um, in, in in our lab, the, the, the size and the, the, the scale is a bit uh, smaller, uh, and the soil structure interaction capabilities at um, the uh, soil structure interaction um, facility at the University of Bristol. You will see later on why I'm I'm referring to this. The um, the lab has participated in a series of funded projects in the past, and its research has strongly influenced the European codes of practice. Um, the, uh, for the last 13 years also, the lab operates the central portal, the distributed access portal of the uh, database that was used and uh, that was created and, and, and used ever since in the project series. And this database is, is a collection of local databases residing at different labs, uh, providing access um, and data, experimental data, uh, of all the um, labs which participate in, in past projects, but also this will happen also in ERIS. So uh, each lab uh, maintains its own node and stores the local data there, and then through a central portal, a user can identify the required uh, testing data and download it from the uh, respective uh, sites. Uh, a, a brief overview of the experience in structural testing the, the lab has um, from the past. Uh, we focused in uh, some main areas. One of it uh, was the retrofitting of members and structures. Here you see an example of um, retrofitting columns with different uh, techniques and also the employing these techniques uh, at the level of a structure, uh, of a structure tested either cyclically or, or uh, through uh, dynamic testing. Um, further on, retrofitting of structures to other techniques like um, uh, reinforced concrete team filling, like on the structure on the left, or um, using textile reinforced mortars and other techniques for um, uh, masonry infill reinforced structures. Um, again, the, uh, the, the lab has also worked on the hybrid simulation, the application of the hybrid simulation technique. Here you see an example of a test that involves several um, participants around the globe, uh, from the University of Toronto at Canada, University of Thessaloniki, University of Patras. Uh, this was a, a real bridge uh, for which the, one of the uh, isolators at the end point was tested physically at the University of Patras, while the rest of the structure was represented numerically, and different modules of the numerical parts were um, analyzed in different um, at different locations and the, finally combining the results and exchanging information during each, uh, each time step as allowed by the hybrid simulation technique. The, the lab also has some, resi some um, uh, experience regarding res structural resilience. On the left, you can see some uh, tests on um, column resilience and their impact. We specially developed uh, actuators for that purpose. And on the right one, the, the, the effect, the you see a study on the effect of um, loss of support in reinforced concrete structures, where uh, in a structure, in a real size structure, um, the, there was a sequential uh, uh, removal of columns around the perimeter and the center of the, of the structure, of the test structure. Um, also, the lab has some experience on, the, on testing the industrial components, like piping systems. Uh, either cyclically, you can see on the left side uh, a configuration of a piping system, a real, a real system from um, an industrial plant uh, tested. Uh, and the, on the right hand side, you see a different configuration, which was part of a hybrid simulation test. This part of the, um, this, the, the, the piping you're seeing on the right is um, um, a system that is is crossing two buildings, and the, the dynamics of the two buildings under earthquake excitation create some differential displacements at the ends of the of the piping, and these differential displacements were the ones applied in the lab while the structures were numerically simulated uh, at a different uh, at a different location, a different lab. 
Uh, now, in the past, um, the lab has also experience in offering transnational access to, to users. Here you will see three examples of such um, transnational access uh, projects that were realized in our uh, installation. The first one is a three-story structure. You see on, on the left that was a non-seismically designed structure, and uh, that was later on uh, subsequently retrofitted with um, uh, fiber-reinforced polymers. And um, uh, this task was tested uh, cyclically at, um, at the facility. Uh, a second um, series of tests regarding the testing of uh, reinforced coating coupling beams um, that were again isolated from, um, from the buildings that were treated uh, numerically. And on the right hand side, you can see the, um, uh, some uh, pictures from the uh, digital image correlation technique that was employed to identify cracks and, and the fields of deformation uh, on the structure. And then finally, the third test regarded um, uh, an existing steel frame that um, uh, the user team wanted to, to, to study. And um, this was a, a deficient, uh, seismically designed, uh, that was deficient for earthquakes. And the, um, the structure was later on uh, the, um, tested as a, first as a 3D structure and then as a 2D structure with a diagonal by a back in restraint brace uh, as a retrofitting measure for such kinds of structures. Um, uh, in, in total, the services that can be offered to users include technical assistance regarding the definition of the specimen, desktop, um, so that it meets the, the, the scope of the project. Also training regarding the testing method and tools employed, like the hybrid simulation technique. Uh, collaboration with users at every step, um, also including logistic support for modalities and uh, uh, up to testing issues. Um, also includes the test execution, assistance in data and metadata curation, and data management, uploading uh, the data to the data access portal, which is a, a requirement for, the, uh, for, for this project. Assistance also in making the data fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and recoverable. And also assistance in preparation of a test report and publication. So it, it, it covers the full spectrum of collaboration with the, with the test teams. And we're available for, um, uh, for, for discussing uh, the different projects with the teams and, and, and offering our assistance. So that's more or less uh, the, the it. If, if there are any questions, I'm, I would be very happy to. OK, thank you. Thank you, Statis. Um, possibly we'll have the questions and uh, maybe if people have some some particular questions about the the research infrastructures toward the end, uh, we can maybe during the question and answer that session. Um, so we will move to the next presentation. It's uh, from the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. Um, unfortunately, they could not participate today. So um, Dimitris Pizilakis uh, shared a video with me and I can show it with you, show it to you now. Hopefully you should see a video on your screen right now. Yes. Um, so essentially a video I, he, he prepared um, for, for the meeting today in, in his absence. Good afternoon. Uh, this is Dimitris Kirilakis, and uh, I will briefly describe the two experimental facilities of Euroscience Test and Europroteas that we offer in the framework of the IRIS uh, research project. So uh, I'm going to be talking about Euroscience Test and Europroteas. Uh, both of the structures and uh, the whole facility moves in the, on the interface between civil engineering and engineering seismology, as well as uh, on the interface between geotechnical and structural engineering. First of all, a few words about the Eurosize test, the site itself. It is a permanent accelerometric network and uh, a, actually a natural laboratory. It has a permanent 3D array of 21 accelerographs. 15 of which are on the surface and six are on the boreholes, inside boreholes. Uh, all of the instruments are high resolution three component, including, uh, and they include the GPS. Uh, we have boreholes at the Eurosize test that go down to almost 200 meters, which is the, the natural bedrock. Until now, we have recorded more than uh, 1,200 events, and uh, uh, the whole test site has. Um, uh, has helped in uh, advancing research in earthquake engineering, geotechnical earthquake engineering, 
solid dynamics and seismology. Now, Eurosize test is the longest running test site of its kind, at global scale. It runs actually since uh, 1993. It operates in uh, the best known valley in the world in terms of uh, studies that have been performed in this valley, both from geometrical and uh, geological, geotechnical point of view. Eurosize test is an excellent site for testing and validating uh, numerical models and has already generated more than 100 scientific publications in peer reviewed journals and conferences. This is uh, the valley, it is in between two lakes, the Lagada Lake and the Volvi Lake. It is in the northeast of Thessaloniki, about uh, uh, 40 kilometers away. You can see there is a horizontal uh, surface uh, accelerometric array, as well as some boreholes at uh, the position which is called uh, TST, in the middle of the valley. You can see here all the tests, the geophysical and geotechnical tests that have been performed throughout these 30 years of operation. Uh, you can find more information in the dedicated website, which is eurosizedb.civil.auth.gr. This is a 3D uh, model, geometrical model of the array. Uh, again, you can see uh, here a cross section at the middle of the valley. This is the cross section, and you can see the position of the borehole, the instruments of the boreholes at minus 40, 140, and 200 meters, exactly in the middle of the valley. And in that specific point, in the middle of the valley, uh, we constructed the Europrotea structure. The Europrotea structure was initially conceived to promote soil structure interaction phenomena. So basically, it is a stiff structure on a soft soil profile. Just to mention that uh, the resonant period of the fixed base structure uh, lies between uh, 0.09 seconds and 0.45 seconds, depending on the structural configuration, I will explain later. And the resonant period of the soil profile, the deep soil profile, it is 1.32 seconds. Uh, the structure of Europroteas was uh, initially conceived to be rocking dominated. Uh, and this is why the, the ratio, of the, the aspect ratio of the sites is around uh, six. So basically, the structure has a reconfigurable mass and stiffness. There is provision for eccentric mass shaker on the roof and on the foundation. And there is provision uh, on the structure for pull-out equipment and uh, to apply forces up to 20 kilo. This is the structure. So basically, it, is, uh, it comprises three reinforced concrete slabs, which uh, of dimensions 3 by 3 by 40 uh, centimeters high. There are four steel columns of uh, rectangular uh, square steel columns of 150 millimeters per side. They were tested in uh, NDUA for their uh, uh, dynamic properties. The total height of the structure is five meters with this configuration that we see to the right. And uh, from slab to slab, it is 3.8 meters. There are also X braces in all four sides. And the top roof slab and the X bracing systems uh, system are uh, removable. So this allows for uh, reconfiguration and uh, actually to play with the mass and the stiffness of the structure. The dynamic characteristics of the structure, here to the right you can see the structure painted. Uh, the dynamic characteristics uh, of the structure uh, are the following. The mass of the foundation is approximately nine tons and uh, depending on whether we have one or two slabs, the roof mass is 9 or 18 uh, tons, more or less. The lateral stiffness, stiffness is in the order of uh, 50 mega newtons per meter. This is for the configuration that you see to the right. And the fixed base frequency is uh, uh, calculated at 9.13 hertz for full bracing and uh, 18 uh, uh, tons of roof mass. If we remove one uh, uh, slab, from the mass, or we change, or we remove the X bracing, this frequency might range in, the, in between um, 3 hertz and 11 hertz. Now, just by placing the structure on the soil, the uh, soil foundation structure interaction system frequency is something between 3.5 and 4.5 for full bracing and 18 tons of roof mass. So you can see that from the 9.1 hertz, it drops down to 3.5 to 4.5 hertz, just because of the soil, uh, the soft soil profile. 
This is a full uh, uh, this is a full picture of Europroteas. You can see here the deployment of the instruments in both horizontal directions. I might want to say that here the eccentric mass shake is placed at the bottom slab, but uh, equally it, it can it can be placed on the roof slab. We have instrumentation in um, uh, the roof slab, the foundation in both directions, and also there is a borehole in the middle of the foundation that goes down to 30 meters where we can place an instrument. Now, what are the services currently offered? There is a web portal for the data dissemination. You can see it uh, uh, over here. There is, uh, we offer technical and scientific support to the existing data and or the design and implementation of new experiments. This is exactly what we did under the uh, SERA framework, the project. We help researchers in the analysis and interpretation of data gathered during, uh, using our infrastructure whenever this is requested. And uh, uh, usually the test that we perform is uh, ambient noise measurements, free and forced vibration tests on Europroteas that are available for SSI and wave propagation studies. Of course, this can be expanded to other types of... What is the modality of access under the ARIES project? The users or the user groups will be provided with a chance to choose between two different types of use for the euro size test. The, the first one is the remote access and the second one is the in-person execution. Uh, in case one, so the remote uh, use of the euro size test uh, or the euro protest installations, the users will be provided with full access to the existing databases of euro size test and euro protest and will be supported uh, by our scientific group uh, to uh, interpret existing data sets and metadata. The case B, which is the in-person execution of uh, the testing, it is uh, our preferred, uh, preferred method. Uh, the users will schedule visits to the Euroscience test and Europroteas to design, conduct experiments, and then uh, uh, gather the results. Uh, the, the test can be anything from soil structure interaction to micro tremor, strong ground motion, area measurements, or uh, even uh, uh, construct new, new structures, get uh, different measurements, etc. Support. The users will be offered full scientific, technical, and logistic support for the use of your size test and your uh, during their visits, of course. Now, uh, just to mention a few. Uh, what kind of projects we run in uh, Euroscience test and Europroteas in SER? Uh, we run tests on, um, for example, the, uh, that, that were used, um, the data sets were used to validate the multi tool platform developed for uh, 3D physics based analysis. Uh, there were tests to study and validate um, uh, advanced uh, 3D finite element software of soil response or the impact of structural rocking. Uh, other tests were then towards the calculation, the back calculations of impedance functions from experiments and uh, comparison to analytical uh, formulations. Uh, other uh, tests were targeted towards the definition of the design spectra, including uh, soil structure interaction or to study 3D site effects incorporating uh, complex site effects into building codes, uh, study rocking foundations and rocking uh, isolation of structures, or uh, even uh, study the effect of meta barriers in filtering the incoming wave motions, studying scour effects to uh, soil structure interaction systems, or uh, uh, study dumping soil nonlinearities or the effect of the rubber, uh, gravel rubber mixtures in uh, uh, what we call the geotechnical seismic isolation. Here you can see a list of the main achievements in uh, the SERA project. These are, uh, were actually taken uh, by the, the last presentation of uh, Professor Paveze, the concluding presentation of all the facilities that were participating in uh, the SERA project. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, you can uh, contact me or us for uh, any queries that you have on uh, Europroteas and uh, Eurocyst. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, I was almost going to thank Dimitris even though he's not here with us. Um, given that Olivia has written in the chat that he needs to uh, get going quite soon, we will move quickly to the presentation from CSTB. So, Olivia, you can share your screen.
Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Is it uh, okay for everyone? Can you see the screen? Yes. Right. So I will present uh, very shortly the climatic wind tunnel, Jules Verne. So what is uh, on this uh, slide, you can see one thermal unit of the wind tunnel on the left and the dynamic unit of the wind tunnel on the right. So both wind tunnels, because they are independent, are open to the ARIES program. And to show you, um, they each has his own uh, fan system, one fan for the thermal unit and six fans for the aerodynamic unit, and a few testing chambers or testing sections that are different uh, in the, the dynamic unit. So you will uh, read this, uh, these values uh, as long as you can. So some illustration of it uh, in the thermal unit, we can have also the artificial sun making the, the light uh, ingress uh, for the, the test. We can study, for instance, uh, thermal insulation of roofs in small houses built like that. But people are in the center of our wind tunnels. Um, in the climatic part of the wind tunnel, you can also have the snow created by snow guns. And we, we can study the snow deposition on buildings. Many other things like the, the snow ingress into vehicles or no impact on people. On the largest part of the dynamic unit, uh, you can have uh, such structures as large as uh, this advertising, or pieces of uh, facade that are tested. They can be also tested uh, for aeroacoustic uh, design, but uh, the wind tunnel is a bit noisy for that. So you, you have some other example of testing uh, in the large wind tunnel. So it is uh, six meter wide, five meter high, in this uh, highest speed section, in which we can go up to 80 meters per second. Uh, in the same location, we can be testing uh, wind turbines, but only small wind turbines, of course. So just uh, one, one slide to show that people are around that. So there are 30 engineers and 15 technical staff, some postdocs, but not so much, only four to five, depending on the time. And um, the, the apparatus or the, 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 the different sensors we can provide are very uh, wide range. So there are many kind of uh, um, outside measurement uh, like, uh, um, like the one done by the meteorology. Um, when we do some ice accretion like that, uh, you imagine that we have a special measurement like uh, the 3D scanner here to scan any surface, even with ice. And we have a pressure system that we built ourselves because uh, we, we couldn't find uh, on the market uh, 1,000 channel at 1,000 Hertz. So you can see everything here. Well, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, just to finish, uh, the fact that we use uh, the, the numerical uh, uh, aspects to provide access to more data than we can show in the in the experiment and also it can help of course to locate the sensors for a, a special uh, a special issue thank you very much thank you thank you olivier um we'll move quickly to the next presentation so back on schedule again we will move to el next so antonio you give us a few slides We cannot hear you, Antonio. Yes, yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I, I was muted. <laughs> uh, okay, so I, I think you see my you see my slides. Uh, so just a brief presentation on uh, on uh, old neck shaking table facility. Um, so um, okay, so uh, old neck is a, a very large uh, research institute uh, dedicated to civil engineering. So with the departments dealing on hydraulics, on geotechnics, on materials. Uh, transportation and so on, um, and uh, with uh, with uh, uh, a large campus where we have uh, our facilities for earthquake engineering uh, are situated here. Uh, we have accommodations uh, in there. We have uh, wind tunnels, uh, wave channels for hydraulics and so on. Uh, different facilities, but uh, the ones that are of interest for the for this project are the ones uh, uh, related to the uh, Department of Structures. Uh, and more specifically to our earthquake engineering and structural dynamics uh, units. 
Uh, so we are uh, um, uh, we we typically perform works uh, on on earthquake engineering on several fronts of earthquake engineering, since experiment from experimental testing to uh, monitoring to risk assessment, uh, numerical modeling, code development, uh, and so on. Uh, and in uh, in what relates to our um, um, shaking table facilities. Uh, our laboratory is equipped with, with uh, several different uh, uh, experimental infrastructures, um, uh, which uh, comprise the large 3D shaking table, uh, which is uh, surrounded by three reaction walls, as you, as you can see here. Uh, and then we have uh, another uh, smaller 1D shaking table, which is uh, currently dedicated to, to hybrid testing. Um, so this uh, a few numbers on the on the main characteristics of uh, of our facility. So the area uh, of our lab, we can build models which go up to ten meters if they are uh, built directly on the shaking table. Otherwise, if if they are uh, built uh, on the on the on the laboratory and then moved uh, with our traveling crane, uh, they can go up to about seven meters, seven point five meters. Uh, and they can weight uh, up to uh, four, 40 tons, uh, which is also the, 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 the weight of the models which can be, can be placed on the, on the, on the shaking table. Uh, so as I mentioned before, so we have, uh, uh, oops, sorry, we have uh, three reaction walls which are surrounding the, the, the shaking table facility. Uh, this is an older picture, but uh, you can see that we can we can uh, um, uh, devise uh, several different and unusual um, uh, test setups and, and not just the the, the, the typical uh, shaking table uh, test setup. Um, in terms of the of the shaking table uh, characteristics, so the maximum payload, so the, the weight of the model is uh, up to 40 tons. Uh, our platform has a, an area of 6.4 meters by 5.6 meters. Uh, with the three independent uh, orthogonal axes, so the, the two horizontal degrees of freedom and the, the vertical degree of freedom, uh, where we can apply displacements of uh, plus or minus uh, 200 millimeters, velocities up to 70 centimeters per second, uh, and the dynamic forces in the vertical direction of 1000 kilonewton and in the two horizontal directions of 500 or 700 kilonewtons. Uh, so our control system is developed uh, in house as well as uh, a number of software for the analysis, uh, data acquisition uh, and signal processing of the, of the, of the experimental activities that, that we perform. Uh, a few pictures of uh, previously performed tests. So uh, these on, on masonry structures, so the type of, 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 uh, of uh, structures which have already been tested on uh, rainforest concrete structures. Um, so typical uh, bare frames uh, or in-field frames or uh, specific um, uh, uh, test setups using uh, the, the reaction walls uh, also to, uh, at, at the same time as the, as the shaking table. Uh, a number of tests also on timber structures and on other, uh, other types of, of, of materials and, and mixed uh, typologies of, uh, of, uh, of structures. So in terms of the, uh, as a summary, uh, in terms of the TI uh, access, uh, the characteristics of the TI that we are offering within series um, uh, correspond to, to access uh, given to six user groups uh, with uh, 150 access dice throughout the, the four years of duration of the project with an expected project duration for each user group which will go from six to, to nine months on average. It depends uh, a lot on the complexity of the test, uh, on test preparation, uh, test design, and so on. Um, the types of tests which are available to, to be performed in the facility. So as, as you saw before, they are uh, uh, shaking table tests or shaking table together with the reaction wall tests. Um, and the test data management is, is an important point. As, as uh, Statis Buzis has already mentioned, uh, is initially stored in our in our local data acquisition system and then to be later updated to the series and, and set a uh, database together with the with the user groups. Uh, I leave you the context of the main people which will be involved and with, who are available to uh, exchange with the user groups, uh, leaders and teams uh, on the on the specificities of, of the tests and proposals to to be uh, delivered. And I leave you a couple of pictures on Lisbon. You're welcome to come here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio.
Um, so we will move to the, the next presentation from CEA in uh, Sakle. I have written uh, Daria Seidi, but um, I think it will be Thierry who will uh, give a presentation. That's right. Okay. Hello, everyone. Okay. Hope you see my presentation. Yes. Okay. Okay, I just uh, so I will present you in, in a few minutes. Um, that can be done uh, through, through, through the risk project uh, in Saclay. So uh, first, a uh, short uh, presentation of the, the, the lab and the activity. So the MC, uh, the Seismic Mechanic Laboratory of CA Paris Saclay uh, is, uh, is uh, in operation uh, with the, uh, is, its uh, experimental, platform, uh, experimental plat platform at Tamari since 1990. 1990, uh, and uh, uh, through our research program, we combine as a uh, other lab, uh, both uh, uh, an experimental uh, activity through the platform uh, and uh, numerical uh, numerical uh, uh, simulation with using our own uh, uh, software, which, which is named uh, CAST3M. So the yeah, idea is combined uh, as, as uh, much as possible, those two tools in order to work both on the uh, problematic of existing facility in, in terms of seismic assessment, mitigation, margin, evaluation, or on new facilities, uh, for example, for improving the design rules, propose, proposing or using the simplified methods uh, and uh, action to on, on criteria and guidelines. So uh, at Saclay, since 1990, uh, we have this platform, which the name is Tamaris, experimental facility. Uh, at now, uh, three shaking tables, one reaction wall, and uh, one, expert, one, one pit uh, are available for tests. Uh, in terms of shaking table, we have three, three shaking tables in operation at now. Uh, I will describe uh, the... the, the, the the Hazare one uh, after because this is the the one we we propose to to use through a risk project. Um, for the two other two the two small table we have, uh, we have a, a three degree of freedom one which is called Tornasol, uh, ten ton payload, a two meter by two meter for the plates, uh, and we have a, a one single degrees of freedom on actual one, which is called Vesuve, uh, the oldest one in CA. Uh, 20 ton payload and so only one axis. So the hugest table of the lab, uh, which is uh, uh, will be used to, to perform the test through a risk project is the Azale shaking table. Azale shaking table, you have here a picture. Uh, so for the, the main characteristics of this uh, test device, the, the, the plate is uh, six meter by six meter. The, the, the total payload of the table is 100 ton. Uh, this is a six degrees of, uh, of, of freedom shaking table. So we have the, we can apply a three actual uh, earthquakes. We have two, we have eight actuators on the table, two for each uh, horizontal axis and four for the vertical one. And additionally, we have five, we have, uh, five uh, static supports. Uh, and in terms of uh, force, the, the, the force of the, the maximum force of the, the actuator is uh, 1,000 kilonewton for static force and less for the dynamic one, but um, or, or around 800 kilonewton for the, the, the dynamic. And, uh, the displacement uh, plus minus 125 for the horizontal one axis and plus minus 100 millimeter for the vertical one. A velocity of around, of around 0.7 meter per second for checks and with a total payload on, of the, on the table we can apply earthquakes up to 1g for the both horizontal axes and up to 2.5g for the vertical one and the frequency range of this table is up to 50 hertz the maximum eight of the specimen we can put on the table it's in the table it's written nine meter, but I would say it's quite, quite less. Uh, it's around uh, uh, seven meter, which is quite, uh, quite uh, high. So it, it means that, uh, as we, I, I will show you some example after, uh, that we can, uh, we 
can perform tests on, on a scale one structure up to obviously reduced reduced scale one that uh, we can apply uh, we can we can have high and heavy specimen on, on the table. Just uh, focus on the, the Sera project and to the two um, the two comp test campaign we, we had during this project. First, uh, uh, it was the, the name of the project was CRM, and the idea was to to understand the, the seismic response of statue and bust, and uh, and mainly to test novel mitigation devices specifically designed for the experiment in order to protect a uh, piece of heart. So uh, this uh, this was quite uh, uh, not not curious for for us, but. Uh, uh, since years, we are working mainly on structures and equipments, uh, and it was uh, the first time we, we worked on piece of art, uh, so it was uh, quite uh, uh, different from the, the, the what we have done before. Uh, it was a huge test campaign, up to 400 seismic tests with different uh, excitation. Uh, we, we applied tests on, on pairs of, of wheel scale marble artifacts boost on pedestal and, and pair of statues. Uh, and the, the, the total amount of, of channels we had uh, on, on the, the, during the test was around 100 uh, different channels, uh, acceleration, uh, angular velocity sen sensors, uh, displacement sensors, and, and so on. And also like laser scanning uh, of the artifacts. Um, I will go up to the second one, uh, this what it was future the future project. Uh, so as you can see, uh, it was on a heavy and high structure, uh, steel structure, uh, on on the table. Uh, the idea was to so it was a full scale one uh, mock-up, uh, and the idea was to to validate steel steel moment frame with a European qualified joint and energy efficient cladings on the near fault scenarios. Uh, it was uh, we we uh, we performed tests on uh, also the, the mock-up was a two-story one based steel frame, a fifty tons payload, uh, five meter high, four by four four point five uh, meter uh, on the on the on the table. Uh, there was more. There were more than one hundred sensors to measure velocity, displacement, acceleration, and strain. Uh, it was uh, just for the, uh, the, this test was a uh, uh, little bit uh, disturbed by the COVID uh, situation, but we, we try to, to go up to the end. Uh, and three different, four, four different mock up were, were tested with different situation of beams to colon, to colon joints. And one of the specimen, uh, as uh, you can see on, on pictures, uh, we, we had panels uh, on the walls in order to test the, the, the not the behavior, but how the panels can, uh, yes, can behavior during the test. So uh, it was a, a, a quite heavy uh, specimen. So this is one, one example of a specimen we can, we can uh, perform. Um, in terms of services, uh, we can, uh, for for Aries project, uh, we will uh, be able to to perform two two experimental campaign on Azale shaking table with a total amount of access days of sixty. As you as you have seen, we we are able to perform a wide range of testing possibilities and structure on structures and equipments or on geotechnical earthquakes engineering. Uh, uh, as for my colleagues. Uh, of the project, uh, obviously the lab uh, will uh, support will uh, have a, will have a, a technical support to users at every steps of the project. Uh, we our uh, our instrument our um, our our transducer uh, can be obviously used during the the the, the, the test campaign up to two hundred and fifty six channels. And with various uh, kind of, uh, of measurements, uh, acceleration, velocity, displacement, strain force. We can also use a, a DIC uh, digital image correction, correction uh, uh, techniques. Uh, the lifting, maximum lifting capacity of the, 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 of the test all is 24 ton, even if we can, uh, we can have 
100 ton on the table. And as I said before, the maximum height we can have in terms of specimen is around seven meters. Seven meter. And finally, as the, the heavy uh, structure, uh, uh, mainly when they are in a reinforced concrete, are uh, constructed uh, in the test hall, we have a dedicated fabrication area that can be used to, to, to um, through the ARIS project to, to cast the, the, the structure and to, to after to transfer the structure on the, on the table to be tested. So this is the end for me. Enfin, last slide, huh? so we are waiting for your proposals. And uh, you have here the two technical CA contacts uh, if you want to, to have an exchange uh, on, the, on our capacity of, of, of testing through, uh, through ARIS project. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Thierry. So we will move uh, quickly to the next presentation from uh, Isis. So it will be either Zoran or Vlad. I'm not sure. If, uh, if Lafka do not show up, I will give the presentation. So let me try to share the screen. Yes. We need to. Can you share it now? Yes. Uh, okay. Great. Okay. Now we are the. Did you know that? Uh, most of the participants in this, this project, we have been uh, actively participating in series, then, uh, but not in transnational access. In fact, in transnational access, we participate into the CERN project. And this is going to be a short, a brief presentation about the capacities and what uh, we are offering and what we can do. Uh, the our laboratory, uh, where the our shake table is in the dynamic testing laboratory. So this is going to be about transnational access within this institute. But we should uh, just remind ourselves that uh, more or less everything officially as a earthquake engineering started uh, due to the 1963 earthquake, catastrophic earthquake in Skopje. 1964, it was uh, the first uh, established uh, the European Association for Earthquake Engineering. 1965 was uh, established uh, the ISIS uh, under the auspices of UNDP, UNESCO, and the help United Nations and uh, uh, other institutions from uh, Japan, most United States. Uh, from 1980, uh, these are the premises where the ISIS is uh, now settled. Uh, the our shake table is a uh, high degrees of freedom shake table. It is uh, as a uh, one horizontal and one vertical direction. So some has the B axial, but it's not B axial, it's a five degrees of freedom. So the six degrees or third extension is missing. Uh, at that time it was, it was constructed, it was, uh, they thought that uh, can be uh, done in this way because there's a one pressure bearing force controlling it at the displacement in order to have a perfect uh, horizontal position of the shake table. The capacity of the shake table, it, uh, it is a uh, uh, roughly 40 tons of payload, but we usually do not go over 35. Uh, this this uh, kinematic performances, which are shown in the, in the table are for the bare table, because uh, we cannot say in advance uh, what kind of, because these performances are mainly dependent of the type of the spaceman, its weight, height, and because uh, uh, also it uh, have this, uh, it's uh, capable for to withstand the overturning moment, which uh, the capacity of the vertical actuators. So we have more than 55, 57 years of uh, experience in dynamic testing, shake table testing, because even prior to 1980, there was a laboratory in the old building of the Institute there's a, there was a one single component shake table, but in generally 
there's more of 400 reports, that's local reports at the Institute, which uh, basically can be divided in three categories, uh, qualification and proof test of different type of uh, devices, uh, uh, equipment, uh, that then goes to the new technologies, of any kind of dumpers and so on, uh, seismic isolation systems, uh, non-structural components and physical models for different type of purposes, mainly for, uh, Proving of the analytical tests, the research, investigation, and so on. This is, uh, let's say, just a portion of what uh, have been done and conducted in the, this new laboratory on Shake Table. This um, the majority of the Shake Table, different type of non-structural elements, uh, various type of equipment for substations, uh, even time, even time. Uh, we have a good cooperation in that time in the. In the early 80s, with the, with the military for testing their vehicles, uh, servo valves on nuclear power plants, different type of facets for the commercial projects. This is particularly for the National Theatre in Cannes in France, and uh, many type of uh, different uh, the devices. Uh, let's go on uh, regarding the new technologies. Uh, the first uh, test on Shake Table was uh, this uh, for the phase isolation, so-called the spring dashboard system of the GERB company from Germany. And it, uh, our cooperation continues for till today, it's more than 30 years. We have uh, different type of tested devices, uh, frictional devices, uh, uh, fluid viscous dampers, and uh, different type of seismic isolation. Even uh, there was a attempt of uh, research of uh, Byzantine churches, a method to be applied for seismic isolation of this kind of building are in the Paul Getty and the FARA project joint uh, investigation. And uh, for the physical models, there is a uh, very types of uh, models, even a model of a Rockville dam, which is uh, with, uh, with the lake, with the reservoir, which is uh, uh, in the vicinity of Skopje, not fully functional. Uh, model of, of uh, wooden roof structures and uh, reinforced concrete structure for, for, for example, the Palace Port in Bologna. This is a unique structure, which was a hotel in Pyongyang that was built, but uh, it never works. It's uh, the highest uh, structure from the reinforced concrete. So we have made the in situ experiments with the false vibration. They made a model in the laboratory uh, uh, houses of uh, masonry houses from Italy, Germany, National Bank in Kazakhstan. The tower, communication tower, which is under construction at the top of the mountain of the Vodna Mountain uh, near Skopje. It uh, was tested. It's a 112 uh, meters high structure. It was uh, tested on the physical model for 116 normally. To, investigate the, the global response. You can, we cannot expect it to such a scale that we can uh, obtain a, a local or uh, stress rate in the, in the structure. Uh, with Canada, we have a good cooperation with Hydro Quebec uh, for the bear house of the machinery house in the uh, running of uh, our plant, uh, different type of historical monuments, response for adobe structures. So, Every kind of material that is uh, still structures, uh, uh, different type of physical models, modeled and designed according to the simulated laws in order to be later on converted results and go to be valid for the real structural systems. Besides the shake table, we can uh, also capable, we are doing the quasi-static testing for the component assemblages. Uh, there's a possibilities to test uh, connections that can be later on combined with the, the models and the physical models and the testing on the shake table, different type of uh, uh, testing uh, capabilities. Also, uh, there is a possibility to combine the uh, mechanical shakers, uh, this uh, harmonic excitation in order to run the different type of tests. So we have tested this of uh, the post Sarah project that was uh, tested under the harmonic excitation in the la our laboratory. And uh, 
there is a system for a telepresence, so called uh, a system of three, uh, 3D, uh, with, uh, 3D cameras. So, so they can, uh, in order to, for the users that are not capable for coming and to be present at the, at the, at the site. And this was in fact invented during the, the COVID period. This was a project with the uh, University of Krakow, uh, a second part of the, uh, the model that was tested under the CERA project. And there was a fully functional in both ways uh, uh, to not to remotely control, but actively to, to participate in realization of the experimental to the, the Microsoft platform of uh, share and sliding. Besides of uh, the, the classical shake table testing of the model, which are connected rigidly to, to the platform and anchored, uh, there's a possibility to combine a made uh, uh, serious uh, testing and uh, investigating in the social structure interaction. We have a very quite new, modern and uh, uh, professionally de designed and constructed laminar box. So for which we have uh, already made the tests in the very near past, successfully test, obtained the results, very quite good. And uh, there is a good uh, opportunity to combine the uh, dynamic testing of shake table testing and the uh, our knowledge and capabilities of uh, geotechnical problems solving. Uh, because we have a uh, sort of a, a unique, uh, the so-called uh, Skopje sand, the natural alluvial sand from Vardar River, that's a river with passing to Skopje. So it is available for lot for testing different type of gear models, detailed investigation and behavior. It's uh, of and use this type of material to, to make uh, in combined with the laminar box on shake table to make different type of experiments. And also, three axial apparatus for determining dynamic properties of the sun samples. And uh, this is a very simple, but very useful shear type, uh, uh, direct simple shear apparatus. It's very old, but it's uh, very functional and very precise and uh, very accurate. In fact, for obtaining the, the shear stress and strain relationship of the soil testing. During the CERA project, we have uh, conducted three projects. One project with, uh, regarding to reinforced concrete structures, the other was with the steel structures. And the third one was with the uh, so-called uh, uh, non-structural elements uh, because it was this intent to investigate the behavior of uh, infill, masonry infill, but uh, strengthen with the polyurethanes in. Uh, so I'm going to show you a little bit uh, more about this, a little bit, just a few slides about the, the first model, first project, there's two model tested. There was two universities from uh, Slovenia, University of Ljubljana, civil engineering faculty, and uh, my university from United States. These are, let's say briefly, uh, there was interaction between uh, share walls and the plates between these uh, shear wall plate structures. The second one was uh, with four universities, two from uh, Ireland. In fact, this is uh, a sort of uh, idea of, uh, of Gerard, but uh, Jamie Goggins and Brian Broderick uh, Elgazuli from uh, you, Imperial College and Jamie from uh, University of uh, Galvik and Brian from Trinity College from Dublin. And there was a, again, participation of the University of Ljubljana. So we made a self-centering system, very unique one. Uh, it was, uh, you can see uh, the one simple test of uh, on the shake table, how it looked like. Very familiar sound of uh, uh, the shake table hydraulics when it's running. So this is one simple test. 
So this was pre-stressed by the tendons. Uh, Self-centering system. Uh, uh, it was, uh, and the system was uh, basically purchased uh, from the fresnel or the anchors and the cables. And it was proved that it's fully functional. It's very nice that the structure remains, go back to its uh, neutral position. And the third one is uh, uh, the behavior and investigation of the masonry infill. And this is one test. You can see how it's uh, with slow motion of the damages of the regular infill, but uh, you can see that there is a polyurethane uh, PVC uh, around the, as the frame around the wall, which prevents from the wall to be damaged and then repaired by the FRPU system, which was, in fact, it was uh, very difficult. We cannot uh, uh, succeed to demolish this model. Uh, for the areas projects, we are going to conduct all four, the four projects. Uh, that means the four user groups are available to, to to apply for the projects. The same as, uh, as Antonio said, as the LNEC, that the one project should last between six and nine months, starting from the scratch, from the preliminary design. So we offer our expertise in conducting the experiments because uh, running and planning the shake table experiments is uh, a little bit uh, tricky and very complex uh, work. Uh, it's looked like uh, running a computer program, but it's uh, much different because uh, a lot of things have to be prepared and very known well in advance in order to have a successful experiment uh, because uh, there is no place for mistakes. If you make a running a computer analysis, you can make a lot of mistakes, but uh, in this case, uh, uh, mistakes can be very hazardous, uh, destroying equipment, even uh, maybe have injuries. So uh, we are very welcome to, to be a host for four user groups. Hope so that we will have uh, uh, good projects uh, during this uh, project. And uh, that will be very, in order to, to for, for the time for the other participants, I will now finish. And I think it's, uh, but even there is a lot of more time to be presented and to be uh, elaborated about this. Thank you very much for your attention. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Zoran. So um, yes, uh, I realize we're going a little bit, uh, not just a little bit, but uh, quite a bit over the time. But uh, as uh, I think Antonio said while he was leaving that um, I think the most valuable thing would be the, the collective video we we have created after this that will be available for, for many more people to see. So um, I would just ask your patience in, in that respect. Um, I have made a quick mistake in jumping past uh, the University of Bristol in the in the order. I'm looking at a different list of partners here, not the actual agenda of the of today's meeting. So um, this was my mistake. So uh, we will just quickly go back to the the one on the transnational access four or five. If I'm not mistaken, uh, but it's uh, six. Sorry. So essentially, the presentation by uh, Tazos uh, Sextos. Thanks very much, Gerald. In fact, no harm done and no mistake made because this is just a series of videos. It doesn't really matter. There's no other uh, Mongol partners. So with your permission, I would like to share my screen. To tell you a few words about transnational access number six, just to confirm, Gerald, but you can see my screen well. Okay, so this is a short presentation about um, what we offer at the University of Bristol uh, with our existing and new facilities, as I'm going to describe in a minute. As you probably know, Bristol has a long tradition in shaking tables and testing specimens from the very one that you see here to other more complicated ones that uh, started being tested in 2005 at the Equals Laboratory. And gradually, this has evolved to a new laboratory that I will also discuss a little bit about because it relates to what we actually offer. 
So making this distinction that now we're offering um, installations shared among two complementary laboratories that actually run as one, but they're physically separated by about half an hour drive. Um, we're offering and we're inviting uh, four transnational access tests by um, equal number of user groups, uh, mobilizing or uh, utilizing three installations. That's one table that you just saw, plus uh, another table, the new one, and the soil pit that I'm going to talk to you in a while. And we also offer our expertise in terms of hybrid testing that we'll discuss later on as part of transnational access number 12. Um, the combination of uh, how these four tests will be split among these uh, three entities plus the hybrid one four uh, has not been fixed. So in theory, could, uh, we could accommodate the combination, but obviously we would prefer to spread the tests among these um, three plus one uh, entities and opportunities. And that will be done um, like in the duration of 208 days, uh, which is roughly 50 days per project, let us say. This is just an overview of how potential users can uh, use our facilities. Um, I guess that um, most of you and the users uh, may be already um, aware of uh, the, let's say, the facility, the equal laboratory within the campus of the University of Bristol, which consists of a six degrees of freedom checking table, three by three. That's a platform um, uh, that can bear a payload uh, of 10 tons at maximum performance, which is up to 2G and has a stroke of plus minus uh, 15 centimeters. Um, users that are interested in monitoring the performance of structures in six degrees of freedom, this is our visualization system. It can accommodate about 3,000 markers through five infrared cameras, and we can reproduce their motion in space and in time with a decent resolution of 0.1 millimeter. And Users that are interested in this 6DOF performance may prefer to pick this table compared to the other one that I'm going to show in a while, because as we know, there are structures that are sensitive to the vertical acceleration of ground motion, like masonry walls, like um, items or pieces of equipment uh, um, related to the nuclear industry that need to be qualified. Um, you can see here reaction core that we have tested in the past. Uh, which is, um, uh, has been tested in this specific uh, table, or structures that rely on low-cost seismic isolation if we, as we have also um, accommodated a series of tests during the last uh, three years in this field. So everything that requires the um, uh, experimental application of um, vertical component of ground motion, this would probably, I mean, this table would be the most suitable uh, installation that we're offering at the University of Bristol. At the same time, um, this shaking table offers the opportunity to bear um, a shaking uh, a shear stack, pretty much a laminar box like the one that Zoran was showing previously. Perhaps ours is a little bit more spot and elongated, uh, but this has been uh, quite useful in um, implementing uh, the soil within the box and a structure within the soil within the box, which is then mounted on the uh, shaking table. You can see examples from an integral bridge abutment, which was my previous slide, or um, energy and natural gas pipelines tested uh, in the shear stack on the shaking table through uh, the framework of a previous uh, European project. Um, this is quite convenient whenever the problem needs to influence of the soil response and it, um, in terms of excitation and soil structure interaction. So one option is that this would go with the existing table or even the new table. But what's this new table uh, is about? Um, the new laboratory, the national facility actually of soil structure interaction uh, of the United Kingdom is uh, now hosted in Bristol. It's a part of um, uh, 140 million investment of the government uh, during the last five years in developing uh, 15 research infrastructures across the country. And it basically started to be designed and constructed four years ago um, to do something that I'm going to show you in a while, because this is hosting, in fact, two or three of the tests that we offer. So um, construction doesn't really matter at this stage, just to get a feeling of the size of the lab, because this relates also to the available space that we have for doing other things. The most important thing that you should keep in mind is that now we're hosting three main entities in this laboratory. A soil pit that I'm gonna talk in a while, like an underground structure, an underground room, if you like, um, and two shaking tables 
with very different features that can act complementary to the existing one. This is how the laboratory looks right now. It opened for business this January. We're quite happy about this. You can see the soil pit just at the middle of the um, photo. And then right at the back is the, uh, so the pit of the large shaking table. And where you see the white bags of the sand that will go into the pit, this is where the hexapod will be installed uh, late August. So that's the laboratory brand new building for um, transnational applications, just to get a feeling of the large shaking table. <laughs> The payload of 50 tons can go up to 2G and 50 Hertz, uh, but it's a three degrees of freedom system. So if a user is interested in size, would like to introduce the weight, then this would be the table of preference compared to the 3 by 360 OF I was just discussing. It is also capable, uh, it's quite powerful to meet Belcore or IEEE standards for uh, size and qualification. And I think this it's, leads to quite an extreme type of uh, test at decent scale. We'll also uh, accommodate uh, a small but very powerful uh, shaking table at the, at the same laboratory, the hexapod. It's called hexapod because it implements six degrees of freedom, not with eight actuators, but with six. And this goes, even though it's small, with a payload of about uh, 800 kilos, um, this can go up to 10 G and frequencies from 50 and to some extreme uh, situations like 80 to 100 Hertz. This is mainly for equipment, things that relate to floor spectra, even the applications that not uh, strictly speaking uh, single earthquake engineer. Something also interesting for the users because we're offering this installation as well is the soil pit that I, I was referring to. The soil pit is this six by five in plan by four in depth. Uh, underground room where you will fill it with sand, saturated and non-saturated, unsaturated, depending on the problem. You can see that there is a trench here that can accommodate um, one actuator or another one actuator if you would like to push something laterally like a retaining wall or an integral bridge abutment. In fact, that's the first test that we're awarded even before opening the, the laboratory. And you can see the flap of the retaining wall, which is going to be hinged into the case that you see at the back of the photo, uh, to be pushed laterally. And then we'll be able to monitor at the back of the wall what's the pressure distribution and what's the failure surface development and uh, everything uh, that's uh, of interest for soil structure interaction and integral bridge abutments in this case. Obviously, that's a different type of a project because these are mainly static projects, as we've got two starting on one dynamic actuator, one mega newton. And also the nature of the loading is different in that it's mainly lateral or top down rather than the bottom up. That is the dynamic excitation in shaking table. But this gives good diversity, I think, in the projects that we offer. In the soil pit, that's just ideas that we're currently working on. We're very happy to accommodate this or other ideas in the new laboratory. Just think big, think offshore, think anything that can accommodate dynamic loads combined earthquake loads, wind loads, wave loads, and other problems like that, cyclic fatigue, uh, problems that are of interest to the offshore industry, for instance. You could also think of novel tests that relate either to the other loading of retaining walls or vertical loading of pile groups in different combinations, applying uh, axial loads and bending moments and lateral loads from the top of the pile head. And these are just some ideas of potential users may think to make the best use of our, our laboratories. Only ever think in a multidisciplinary nature, think of um, ground board vibrations, uh, train induced vibrations, uh, slope stability with or without some um, spring water to um, saturate the sand or, or not. And these are just some ideas. Like, like I said, everything big that can go into onto the large checking table. With that, I will just close this presentation, but just summarizing what we're basically offering, which are application in structural dynamics and uh, geotechnical um, earthquake engineering. Obviously, soil structure interaction, the facility is designed for that. And multi-scale, because in many projects may wish to work a little bit on their own laboratory at small scale, optimize their design, then come and run a small number of well-designed large-scale tests at, um, at the premises of the University of Bristol. Multi-hazard, we're very open. Smart materials, we're very open. Resilient infrastructure, um, of, uh, resilience of infrastructure, of energy networks, structural health monitoring, and quality benchmark tests that can be um, facilitated in a well-controlled environment. This is just some ideas for the potential users 
uh, as it was mentioned many times, I think it's a very good practice to talk to us in advance. I know it's not necessary, but it's really very important so that we scale the problem appropriately, we cost it, we list the tasks, and we know that the feasibility box is checked and the proposal has good chances of being awarded. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tazos. So we will move uh, quickly again to the next presentation. It is from the University of Genoa, who have prepared a video I will share right now. Um, here we go. Good afternoon. I'm Maria Pierrepetto from the University of Genoa, and together with my colleagues Massimiliano Burlando and Giuseppe Riccardo, I present the transnational access to our laboratories. University of Genova is a public institution placed in the northwest of Italy. Founded in the 15th century, it is one of the oldest universities in Europe. Actually, it enrolls more than 33,000 students and 1,250 faculty members. Its mission is teaching, research, and technology transfer in the broad fields of humanity, social, medical, natural sciences, architecture and engineering. Two laboratories are made available in the project, a boundary layer in tunnel and one scanning LIDAR. They belong to the Department of Civil, Chemical and Environmental Engineering of the Polytechnic School. The team is composed by the Giovanni Solari Wind Engineering and Structural Dynamic Research Group. It is made by five permanent staff postdoc scientists, PhD students, and technical staff with expertise in atmospheric physics, structural mechanics, dynamics, and structural engineering. The group has been working in the wind engineering field for more than 30 years and has gained experience and competencies in many topics, like atmospheric physics, meteorology, climatology, developing now casting and forecasting models, statistical analysis, and wind climatological mapping, wind excited and aeroelastic response of structures, proposing analytical, numerical, and experimental methods, wind effects on large infrastructures, in particular railways and seaports, in collaboration with operators and management, wind energy assessment and wind power integration into supply network, computational wind engineering, in particular addressing urban and complex environment wind flow, full-scale wind and structural monitoring, realizing and operating an extensive network of instruments recording wind in the wind field, in the free field, and the study of thunderstorm in the framework of the ERC Thunder project aimed at detection, simulation, modeling, and loading of thunderstorm outflow. The team is available to support the user developing research in our laboratories. The first facility shared by the University of Genoa is the Giovanni Solari Wind Tunnel. It is a closed loop subsonic circuit whose main features are summarized in this slide. The wind tunnel is characterized by a low level of turbulence and a very good velocity uniformity. The wind tunnel features two different test sections. The first one located immediately after the contraction cone at the beginning of the working chamber, and the second one at the end of the working section for atmospheric boundary layer tests. In particular, the section one is mainly used for aerodynamic and aeroelastic testing of sectional models as portions of bridge decks and the structural elements. In fact, the static and dynamic setups are physically separated in section 1A and section 1B, making their use easier and faster. The section 2 is mainly used to evaluate the action of wind of structures in ABL conditions, modeled by means of artificial roughness blocks and spires, up to 70 configurations corresponding to different real ABL. We have experience on models of buildings, wind turbines, roofs and ships, studies of pedestrian comfort, and analysis of wind fields 
in complex terrain. The main equipment related to the static and above all dynamic test sections one concern high precision force balances, stepper motors for rotation of models up to the tenth of a degree, a two degree of freedom dynamic rigs, and current devices to simulate the damping, a release mechanism for decay to resonance test, wooden turbulence grids, laser and accelerometer devices, the possibility of performing flow visualization and to use stereo PIV and DIC systems. Moreover, we are starting to design an active grid, which is expected to be operational by the end of next year, with aim to replicate the, the main dynamic features of the thunderstorm downburst. The main equipment related to the ABL working section, section two, concerned Cobra probes, which can be used also in dynamic static test, and the robotic arm for automated movement of the probe, Canomax and DeWin probes, auto wire anemometers, an automated turning table, two pressure measurement systems, a 344 channels on MAID, and a 96 channels PSI, the latter also usable in section one, high precision force balances, a new specific design of the static grid able to simulate thunderstorm wind profiles, and also in this case, the possibility of performing a flow visualization and to use stereo PIV and DIC systems. Here, you can see example of a static test carried out in both section 1A and 2, in particular, wind field measurements in complex terrain, wind-induced action on a pedestrian bridge, pressure measurements on a tall building with different wind profiles, and the measurements of the forces exerted by the wind on a model boat. We also have a great, great experience in measuring pedestrian wind speeds. In this slide, you can see some example of recent dynamic testing. In particular, including a realistic stability test on a highway bridge model with a clear problem of torsional oscillations in the original configuration. Flow visualization of a pedestrian bridge in which there were a vortex induced vibration problems. There is a clear weak recirculation also inside the deck. The performance assessment of a vertical axis wind turbine varying the flow condition, for instance, the turbulence intensity. In all this example, is it possible to provide, using a suitably prepared model, measurements of the flow velocity, displacements, accelerations, and pressures? The support offered in all the phases of the activities under ARES include a specific assistance for the design and manuf manufacture of the scale models, the travel and subsistence costs for the user, a preliminary training period to get the users familiar with wind tunnel testing technologies and procedures, the release of all the acquired raw data, videos, and photos based on user needs, routines for results interpretation in order to facilitate the user's work for both scientific purposes and technical application, and the possibility to follow all the experimental phases via streaming tool. The second facility that the University of Genoa will share during the project is a LiDAR to measure full-scale wind flow fields. The WindCube 400S is a state-of-the-art heterodyne pulsed Doppler LiDAR with the capability to take wind measurements up to ranges of 15 kilometers and 75 meters of resolution. The LiDAR emits from its head 
past the emissions of highly collimated light energy and measures the line of sight velocity, which is the radial velocity along the beam. It is calculated based on the principle of the Doppler shift in the frequency of the backscatter the radiation. The instrument is installed in the port of Genova on a quay at five meters above the sea level in a position sheltered from sea waves and located inside the restricted area managed by the Port Authority of Genoa. And this is the LIDAR when it looks at the sea. LIDAR can scan the atmosphere using fully configurable patterns mixing together, if necessary, PPI scans, which means in the horizontal or using conical paths, RHI scans, which means using vertical sections or vertical profiles. Some post-processing tools are also already available like the adaptation of the single dot software, which originally was thought to be used with meteorological radars, to retrieve B-dimensional wind fields from the radial components measured by the LiDAR. To conclude, some examples of possible applications. For instance, here the LiDAR was used to study the thunderstorm outflow produced below a common nimbus cloud. However, many other applications can be proposed in the wind engineering, meteorology, or wind energy field. For instance, to study the wake produced by real structures immersed in the atmospheric boundary layer, or to measure other meteorological quantities related to the clouds, to the ABL, or pollution and wind fields in the urban environment. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, so we will quickly move to the next presentation. It will be by um, Western University in Canada. So I think Adrian. Yes, thank you. Hello, Adrian. It's uh, Adrian Kostas at the uh, Windy Research Facility in, uh, at Western University in uh, Canada. Um, and presenting the DA9 at international access for, for the two installations that we are providing part of the ERIS project. I'd like to start to briefly introduce our research group established in the 60s by uh, esteemed Professor Davenport. Um, we are now, we now have about seven <coughs> professors focused on, on wind research, wind engineering problems. Uh, 16 research engineers and technicians and a large group of uh, graduate students uh, focusing in wind area. Um, it's most of these people are kind of under the umbrella of civil and environmental engineering uh, department, but we do have other, other departments uh, kind of uh, participating in, uh, in various projects, even though they are not kind of uh, strictly focused on, on kind of wind research. Uh, over the years, our group participated in um, many well-known projects around the globe, <clears throat> be it uh, tall, very tall buildings, long span bridges, or anything else really involving the wind effects on, on structures. Uh, our research output, as well as practical findings, uh, ended up contributing to, to the building codes to, um, and, and other standards, as in transmission lines, uh, solar panels, and, um, and other structure. Um, also, we like to believe that they, they produce a good influence on, on the engineering standards uh, in Europe in Asia as well. In terms of the facilities that our group uh, manages, um, we have three large facilities, the Windy Dome, uh, the newest uh, of, of them, and uh, the 3LP lab, uh, nicknamed 3 Little Peaks, um, and the boundary layer wind tunnel. The boundary layer wind tunnel is grayed out here because it's not uh, one of the facilities of the part of Iris. Uh, we saw that the traditional wind tunnel was well uh, represented uh, by other groups in Europe. Uh, and we decided to, to complement that offering with uh, the Windy Dome and 3LP lab 
as unique facilities, uh, unique installations. The Windy Dome is, well, it can do and it can tackle many of the projects that the traditional wind tunnel can, can do. Uh, Windy Dome is really focused on non-synoptic events, um, being able to generate uh, very complex wind systems like tornado downburst um, and even kind of local systems um, as experienced in mine shafts or other kind of um, large structures that end up having uh, particular airflows. Uh, the 3 lp lab is focused on full-scale testing or component of full-scale full uh, structures, uh, as we will see in the next few slides. In terms of our research areas, um, the main focus is, is the impact of, of severe, severe weather events, um, with wind as being the, the number one factor, uh, but we also um, focus on uh, computational modeling to complement or aid that, uh, that, that area, uh, wind damage and mitigation and uh, performance based design based on, uh, based on the findings and the research uh, areas that, uh, that uh, we were interested in. Um, also, um, our group from the very beginning was focused on, on um, training um, the, the next generation of engineers. And uh, it's, uh, it's one area where we, we put a lot of, of effort. In terms of uh, Windy Dome, um, it's a fairly large facility um, for straight flows. We have a section of about 15 meters by 3.5 meters. It's a bit more restricted for, for downburst and tornado um, to, to about five meters by, by 3.5 meters. Uh, the actual chamber is 35 meter wide, uh, the 15 meters being the area that uh, is, um, is considered uh, applicable for, for, for the kind of the models that we can, we can actually have inside. Um, we do a wide range of testing uh, in, in the Windy Dome facility, starting with scale model testing. Um, as as uh, most traditional wind tunnels uh, focused on overall structural loads and building response, cladding and components, pedestrian level wind. Um, as you can see from the pictures, usually the model um, in white sits at the center. We have a proxy area uh, replicating all the surrounding buildings and uh, this uh, entire kind of setup is exposed to, to wind at uh, uh, various wind directions. Uh, in terms of measurements, uh, similar to, to the wind tunnel um, in, in Genoa and the Jouven wind tunnel, we employ the same um, equipment, uh, pressure scanning systems, uh, force balance, uh, strain gauging, uh, Cobra, uh, hot wire on monetary and uh, uh, very powerful data acquisition system um, that, uh, that can measure various uh, <clears throat> various aspects of, of the impact of, of wind on the model. Uh, as one example, uh, this is a simulation of a tornado. Um, of uh, an event uh, close to a few years back that happened close to Ottawa, where um, a group of 12, 15 houses were severely damaged by, by a tornado. And this is a kind of a simulation trying to replicate that, also trying to apply various kinds of tornado and tornado path uh, to, to, the same, um, to the same scenario to, to learn as much as possible um, in terms of, of uh, building building better and, and kind of learning from, uh, from the uh, 
current uh, current building uh, particularities. In this particular instance, the uh, pressure uh, pressure scanning system is being used to uh, obtain a good distribution of uh, pressure in different in different locations uh, in uh, uh, several of the buildings uh, under test. A similar test in this case with the micro burst or downburst, uh, the impact of uh, on our transmission line is uh, it's being measured. Um, also, because of the size um, of the test section, we can uh, we can tackle larger, uh, larger either larger models or even like full scale <coughs> um, devices, like in, in this case. Uh, uh, residential wind turbine or uh, solar panel array. Uh, for full scale building testing, like an entire house or components of it, we um, provide access to the 3LP lab uh, facility. Um, the essence of it being the, the pressure loading actuators. Uh, which are able to control dynamically pressures inside uh, uh, some boxes, we call them pressure boxes, which are being applied either on the building in case of a full-scale building or uh, various components. Uh, an example here would be, um, you see a couple of pressure boxes on the other side of a garage door and uh, the pressure inside is, um, controlled by the pressure uh, actuators. Um, so that will be the, the effect on, on, a, on a garage door. Um, simulating a profile from a, from a thunderstorm. Um, we also have like a, a very strong um, computing center and compu uh, computing capabilities um, is not offered per se as, as part of the ERIS project, it's just the expertise uh, as mentioned because the expertise um, can be used in various projects. Same as uh, our expertise in other areas as um, UAV, flight controls, tree studies, various kind of new designs of wind turbines um, uh, and, and uh, even field measurement campaigns. So all, all this expertise uh, as it happened in the past can, can be used to, to uh, some of the projects that, um, that we did and uh, uh, we are looking forward to do as part of the this project as well. This one is a, 3D capture of, uh, of a particular type of tree in uh, under wind condition, various wind conditions. Uh, we also have capabilities, extended our capabilities in terms of uh, large scale PIV and particle tracking. Uh, and, uh, and we are kind of always uh, happy to work with, uh, with the clients for the user groups to um, to kind of identify the best uh, the best way to <clears throat> to reach our uh, research goals. For the, the next uh, four years of the project, uh, we're expecting somewhere between nine and twelve um, projects, depending, of course, on the size and the um, the effort involved with each one of them. Um, in uh, terms of uh, contact, uh, we can be reached by website, the email provided or directly by, uh, by phone. Uh, and uh, we will have, depending on the project specifics, we will have the right person uh, getting in touch with, uh, with the user group.
Hey, um, thanks, Adrian. Uh, always nice to see those videos again of the um, of the wind tunnel. Um, so we're almost there. So we have, I think, two more presentations. So I won't waste any time just getting to the to the next one. Uh, the next is from um, University of Eindhoven. So it will be Stephanie Gilmeyer, who cannot be here, but has shared a video with us as well, which I will play back now. Hello, everybody. My name is Stephanie Gilmeyer, and I'm the operational manager of the atmospheric boundary layer of internal in Eindhoven. In the following about 10 minutes, I will give you an overview of uh, possible tests that can be realized in our wind tunnel. So, this is the TUE atmospheric boundary layer wind tunnel. We are located in Eindhoven in the Netherlands. This wind tunnel is rather new. The construction began in 2015. And it took in total two years to finish uh, the construction of the building and the wind tunnel, so it could be inaugurated in December 2017. We've decided to build a closed circuit wind tunnel with four axial fans in the back, followed by a long diffuser, two corners equipped with guide vanes, and a contraction section with honeycombs and screens, um, an inlet. Um, which is followed by a 27 meter long test section, which is three meter wide and two meter high. The test section itself is equipped with two turntables, one in the front and one in the back, which we use for two different test purposes, which I will show you later in this presentation. And then two more corners to guide the flow back to the fence. Some key characteristics of the wind tunnel, we can uh, detect the lowest velocity of 0.3 meter per second, which is measurable, a maximum of 30 meter per second, and a free stream turbulence intensity also for low wind speeds of below 1%. The test section, as I mentioned, is 27 meter long and is 2.3 meter in height and width. The turning tables have a diameter of 2.5 meters. Obviously, such a wind tunnel comes with a crew, it's not a one person job. So, you have a scientific director who is uh, Professor Bert Blokken. Then, uh, the next one is me, Stefanie Gilmeyer, the operational manager. And uh, obviously, we also have uh, scientific staff. We have uh, more than just one scientific staff. But depending on the project, uh, we will have to see who supports um, this uh, test. In this case, I've included uh, Dr. Alessio Ricci because he has by far the most experience in wind tunnel modeling. Then uh, equally important uh, are our engineer and our technical experts, uh, Jan Diepens and Katja Maas. So to the two turntables, we, we use the turntables, as I mentioned, for two different test um, scenarios. And um, the turntable here um, in the back, which is further downstream, we use for operational mode one, or well, how to call it, the atmospheric boundary layer mode, because obviously we will need a fetch um, to set up the roughness and spires to develop the correct profile. So for this, we would use the, the later turntable. We have a second mode, which is used for low turbulent tests or the open section or turbulent grids. You will see what I mean by, by those names a little later. And for this, we use the first turntable, but for now I will focus on the atmospheric boundary layer part. I first give you a few examples so you get an idea of what can be done, and then I provide an overview. Um, so this is an example of a test we realized um, on campus. So this is the TUE campus, and the interest was to measure Passage pressures uh, on a specific building in uh, relation to the velocity uh, observed on top of that building for different wind directions. So you see the inside of the wind tunnel with the, a specific setup of the atmospheric boundary layer and the uh, um, mock-up at the turntable. This is just a close-up of that specific building. We're using the pressure tabs, a copper probe, which is uh, hovering above to measure the velocity on the roof where in reality is an anemometer in place. Another test, um, similar ABL setup, but this was for a PhD student. Um, the uh, aim was to assess the natural ventilation potential um, from differently designed houses with openings um, and partitions inside. Uh, obviously, if measurements inside of a building are needed, it is not 
easy to access it for measurement purposes. So we do have a plexiglass turntable, which you see here in the center of uh, below the model. And uh, we have a laser Doppler anemometer with which you can uh, then measure non-intrusively from below. And a close up here, you can see um, that the two laser beams from the LDA are coming from below the model, uh, the intersection point is inside of the building. The flow was seeded to measure velocities inside. And a last example of uh, the specific ABL setup is uh, also from a PhD student of ours, and um, she was analyzing the um, effect of external pressures on uh, a uh, depressurized building, and the purpose is asbestos removal. So the asbestos gets removed and the building is usually depressurized so that no hazardous uh, particles can escape into the atmosphere. But no one knows exactly yet how the external pressure can affect this internal depressurization. So to give you also an overview of possible tests that can be realized within this project, instead of only giving examples of conductor tests, as you can see that for the ABL, we can test um, um, the built environment, uh, meaning static tests uh, of wind forces or the ventilation, uh, wind comfort studies or pollutant dispersion. And um, of course, also for maritime research, um, we could test the static uh, loads, um, the static um, wind forces on ships. I will not focus yet on the low turbulent part that um, first I will give you an overview. But the available equipment what we have is also of interest. Um, we have uh, two automated turntables with a high precision, precision angle adjustment um, for velocity measurements, obviously Peter tubes and then copper probes and the LDA. We have 256 differential pressure scanners for the simultaneous uh, pressure measurements. And for forces, we have several high accuracy custom-made force balances of various range that will of course depend on the object of interest. And for the pollutant dispersion, we have um, a fast FID, a flame ionization detector. So to the second mode, um, for which we use um, the turntable closer to the inlet, we uh, test um, well, objects which don't require an atmospheric boundary layer flow. So this is why we call it the low turbulent part. And here from uh, the top um, left, you can see uh, um, well, cyclists in the peloton. And the interest of this test was to assess the drag of each individual cyclist in the peloton. Um, so for this, we have uh, a measurement platform with um, a balance uh, underneath that is uh, movable to, to different positions and to assess uh, the forces. Um, of these objects, let's say. So obviously this would not need to be a, a cyclist, this could be anything else. Um, in the lower left picture, it's um, also a cyclist and drafting behind a motorbike. We also simulated overtaking maneuvers. Um, so in the end, all of this uh, uh, equipment is of course also usable for different objects like cyclists, for instance, for cars. Um, here we have a, a setup of uh, a car on the turntable in the front um, for which uh, the aerodynamic loads and the weight flow was, was measured with a 3D component sensor. Um, just for completion, because uh, the wind tunnel is relatively well known, at least in the Netherlands, for um, its research and collaboration with the, the cycling team, um, Team Jumbo Visma. So uh, here on the right, uh, you can see um, our test setup for, for the cyclists. Uh, and we can also test for, for other sports and real real people in the wind tunnel. So the bottom right here is a speed sphere. But just for completion, it is not necessarily um, of greatest interest for, for this specific project. Another um, key um, characteristic of our wind tunnel is that this 27 meter long test section consists out of nine individual modules. So each window here is basically one module. And those modules are really movable, at least the first three. And you can see on the picture here on the right that the first three modules, they were moved out. So they were moved over the pitch and are then stored um, in this position where the picture was taken from. And below is an hydraulic lift that usually rests within this pitch. 
that can be hired and then we don't have any ceiling and walls anymore. So larger objects can be tested in the open section. So we don't have a problem with blockage for those tests. Um, also similar here, uh, the setup of the open section, now a picture from inside the rest of the wind tunnel. Um, and uh, a different uh, turntable here in the front where a solar panel is installed. But the highlight why I included this picture is here the turbulent grid. So we have several turbulent grids to generate a um, specific turbulence intensity with certain characteristics at the um, first turntable. So then to summarize what's possible to test in the low turbulent part uh, of our wind tunnel. Obviously for automotive uh, research or automotive tests, we could assess the flow field, the aerodynamic forces, pollutant dispersion from the exhaust um, or the drag reduction because of spoilers or um, any other um, idea. Then the sports aerodynamics tests, um, I don't want to leave them unmentioned. Obviously they are also with the drag reduction or the effect of crafting and overtaking as I mentioned before. Um, the available equipment hasn't changed, so that is still um, the same equipment. Of interest for you, I thought is also um, which possible scales uh, we, we test in our wind tunnel. So for the ABL, we usually test at scales one to 40. Um, if the large scale turbine structures are not necessarily relevant for um, the parameter of interest or uh, up to one over 500. Then for the low turbulent part, um, obviously, as I mentioned, we can test full scale people or um, anything that, that fits within the open section um, width and height wise. Um, but if we have multiple objects like the cyclists uh, or smaller cars, then we usually um, apply a scale of uh, one over four. So a few more um, characteristics now, which are mainly relevant for the open section tests or for the tests uh, on the turntable in the front. Um, the turbulence intensity with grids that can be achieved um, reaches from 5% to 15%. So we have different grids for different turbulence intensities. Um, and the test section length in open section is nine meters. Yes, and with this, I would like to thank you for um, your interest, uh, we are looking forward to welcoming you in Eindhoven, and if you are interested, then you can contact one of the three people mentioned here. Good. So thank you very much. Okay, so um, we are almost there, in the sense that um, we just had the presentation from uh, Eindhoven. Uh, Olivia has already given a presentation. I know the GRC could not join us today. So I think the last one that is remaining is just a quick presentation from either Tassos or Stat Statis on the possibilities of hybrid simulation. Um, I can do that. Yeah, Tassos, who will um, okay. take the step uh, Professor Busias. So I will just share my screen. This is a joint presentation um, by Professor Busias and myself, uh, the University of Padras and the University of Bristol on transnational access number 12, uh, which relates to hybrid simulation. Uh, it is quite challenging and a little bit alternative, if I may say so, because it involves two different laboratories or at least two different laboratories, depending on the problem. So this geographical distribution uh, geographically distributed hybrid simulation is something that has been one of the things that um, I, I guess this proposal and this project is quite uh, very much looking forward to if we find some interesting projects that we can accommodate. For those users that maybe are not very familiar with the context and the concept of um, hybrid simulation, uh, basically it refers to complex and large structures that cannot be tested on one side, um, and therefore they, they need to be substructured into, into computational and experimental uh, entities. Typically, the more complicated parts are tested and the ones that we're more confident in modeling, we run them numerically and there is an analysis coordinator somewhere uh, around the, the same side or somewhere located somewhere else that coordinates the um, dynamic degrees of freedom um, that are shared between the different uh, laboratories. 
So from the proposal stage, this concept was put forward to accommodate three main components of the call, uh, which was not only to offer services to users, but also to address um, some challenges um, in terms of uh, investigating the efficiency of environmental friendly technologies and do some you know, blue sky, curiosity driven, a little bit different types of tests that are or can be multi-hazard potentially. And we're going to share some ideas because obviously the users will define what they would like to do, but these ideas kind of provide the framework of what could be done within a reasonable amount of time uh, between the two universities. So there are three options for the users. One is a classic, let us say, hybrid simulation, assuming the problem of a, a substructured bridge. We're gonna discuss about this or a greener version of it, which will be a little bit more complicated due to the nature of the loads that could potentially involve a wind turbine and or a project that would uh, make use of the interaction between the soil and whatever the infrastructure that is tested uh, is. Um, so in brief, this uh, will, uh, let me start with the first one, which is the classic, let's say, hybrid simulation of a, a substructure bridge. Assuming that this will take place in one lab, because that's a version or in multiple sites, um, this technique is obviously well established. It's it's known how to be done, but it also requires some expertise. So the proposals somehow will need to involve groups that understand and are familiar with the limitations and the capabilities of such a technique. Ideally, this would involve up to two actuators in each of the two laboratories, if we're talking about this specific uh, two laboratories. Uh, so that we make sure that we can accommodate uh, the, the forces and the boundary conditions uh, that are prescribed by the specific problem. One important uh, thing that we need to mention here is that for a pseudo-dynamic test, um, these are suitable tests for problems that are not rate dependent. So we have to also consider the phenomenon before we decide uh, what the best uh, testing method uh, would be. And as I mentioned previously, there, there is an option for a third European uh, partner to be involved in this procedure, provided obviously that the lab is compatible with the problem, our capabilities, the, the formats, and the, the types of the tests that we are, are looking for. But obviously, ahead of the um, uh, development of 5G technologies, even a, a slow test, let us say, in expanded time, um, would pave the way if this is done between two geographically separated sites for potential real-time hybrid testing when this is more uh, feasible um, and can address the latency problems because that's the, the network delays actually what's hindering uh, the wide scale application for real uh, and uh, rate dependent problems. Having said that, um, in case of the second version of a hybrid test which would, could involve a green test, let's say a wind turbine, uh, let me just say the, the yes and the no. So if you see here in the uh, figure, uh, there are two types of tests, pseudodynamic and real-time hybrid simulation, and in the vertical axis and in the horizontal axis, you can see the option of having a single site or multiple sites. So things that could be done is one, for example, a real-time hybrid simulation in a single site. That would probably be quite novel because it would address soil forces, water forces, and also the different similitude laws between aerodynamic and hydrodynamic effects. That would be an option or something of this type, let us say. A yes would also be a pseudodynamic testing of any infrastructure in a single site. It would also be feasible to have a bridge type of a problem, an extended structure, um, a bridge or a pipeline separated between different sites, but obviously tested pseudodynamically. This is something we have done, for example, between the University of Patras and the University of Bristol. What we can't promise, and most probably we can't, and there's no reason to aim to deliver, is real-time time hybrid simulation among different sites. But this already provides some interesting opportunities for potential users uh, to do something um, uh, quite exciting in case, and that's the third option we will offer, the third and the last. We would like to introduce experimentally the influence of the soil with, in a framework that would involve the two sites, Patras and Bristol, um, and two separated substructured physical entities in Greece and the UK, plus a numerical modeling of the remaining part, in this case, uh, the abutments and the deck. 
one option would be just as a brainstorming to, to inspire our imagination would be that we test the peer at, in Padra, at the university structures lab in Padras. And then with the common degrees of freedom, these forces are transferred to what I just showed um, as a physical test, slow test within the pit by means of two vertical actuators, for instance. Another version of such a problem would be to substructure the problem differently, where again, the computational part, the deck would be the same. Again, the peer would be tested physically at the University of Patras, but it would consider to be fixed. And then the boundary conditions, like the stiffness, if you like, the lateral stiffness of the abutments uh, would be tested, measured and tested and measured, and then returning this, this value for every time step uh, in the form of a real, um, not a real, a pseudo-dynamic test involving the soil pit of the University of Bristol. Obviously, we don't have two soil pits, but that would basically mean that we make use of the symmetry and we measure in the one and we're assuming the other. And the final, final version, if we really would like to explore potential collaboration with some of our aerodynamic experts, this could probably mean that we substructure the problem a little bit differently. We get a series of wind loads arising from some wind tunnel or any other type of analysis or computational simulation from a group that is expert in, in wind engineering. And then we use that as an input. We substructure the problem as we discussed previously. But in this case, Padras is testing, for example, rate independent dubbers that they have developed already and they're really very novel. And Bristol can probably mimic the response of um, the ab uh, abutment embankment system in the lateral direction in the way that you see in the figure. And again, we take you make use of the symmetry and we assume what's going on on the other side of the bridge. So these are just some ideas that we think are feasible. There are mainly the main purpose is to draw what can be done and what is the framework within which the users can think of. If they can come up with a better idea, by all means, we would be very happy to discuss it. Um, but we're uh, waiting to see what the potential interest um, of the potential users would be in this coming call. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Tazos. Um, I think that is it with the presentations. We're slightly over time, uh, only about an hour and a half, but um, I think it was worth it to, to take our time with the presentations instead of uh, rushing things, because I think in the end, the, the, the value from this video and the, 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 the meeting we're having will, will come also afterwards. So. Um, so I think the last item we have on the agenda is that any of the people joining here today have any questions, comments, queries, things they would like to ask um, just while, while we're all sitting here. Um, I know there are quite a, just, just a few, let's say external non-project members here. I can see uh, at least from the names I recognize, but um, at least the opportunity to, to ask something if they, if they wish. No, I guess not. Um, okay, so I guess we will end uh, end it here.